Broadcasting live from Chicago Comics in the heart of the Windy City. This is Mainframe Comic Con with live appearances by Kevin Smith. From Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Clark Gregg. Game of Thrones star, Natalie Emmanuel. Star of Ant-Man and the Wasp, David Desmalchian. From ABC's Nosferatu, Joe Hill, Jakara Smith, and Jamie O'Brien. Creator of the Toxic Avenger, director Lloyd Kaufman. Kings in the Hall star, actor and comedian Scott Thompson. A rare interview with poster artist Boss Logic. Emmy Award winner Seth Green. Comic creators Donny Cates, Chuck Olenek, and David Mack. And from New Girl and the new movie Bloodshot, Lamorne Morris. Stars of the movie Clerks, Brian O'Halloran and Marin Gigliotti. With celebrity guest hosts Robert Meyer Burnett, Perry Nemiroff, and Jay Washington. From ABC's Comic Book Men, Ming Chen. And special appearances by Natalie Dreyfus, Claudia Wells, Kane Hodder, Red Brown, and a whole lot more. So stay home and nerd out. This is Mainframe Comic Con. Man. I love that theme song, guys. Welcome to Mainframe Comic Con, day one of what is proving to be the largest celebrity uh, event of the season, guys. Welcome to Mainframe. Over the next two days, we have got tons and tons of guests, all the top names in the world of entertainment, television, movies, comic books. We've got 50 plus guests, over 20 hours of streaming content in two full days, guys. Uh, just a reminder, Mainframe Comic Con is a 100% for charity telethon. So take a second, head on over to mainframecomiccon.com, click that donate button, give what you can. All 100% of the proceeds are going to go to the Hero Initiative and the American Red Cross COVID-19 Relief Fund. So check it out. Remember, if you have any comments for any of our celebrity guests, uh, leave them in the chat. We're going to ask them at the end of each segment. So let's not waste any more time, guys. Our very first guest here at Mainframe Comic Con, you know him, is Agent Coulson from Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., uh, the Avengers guys. He is an accomplished screenwriter, director, producer, the one and the only. There he is, Mr. Clark Gregg. Clark, how you doing? I'm good. You're really How are you? Good. Your audio, you, oh, we are doing phenomenal. Congratulations, by the way, on being the first guest here at Mainframe Comic Con. It's a big deal. I'm, I'm honored to be here. Uh, looks like I just lost my feed. But I'm here to, to say that. Clark, uh, thank you for taking the time. So uh, what, what have you been up to in this whole pandemic? Well, I mean, the short answer is not a hell of a lot. Um <laughs> You know, the lockdown was kind of sudden and uh, and it's, you know, something I certainly respect and something we've got to do. So I've just been, uh, you know, catching up on some reading and some writing for a while. I was I need to exercise in the mornings or else I get insane by about two o'clock um, just mentally. So I at first I was I took up surfing not too long ago. So I was going out and hitting the ocean, which was really effective. They shut that down. Um, <laughs> I, I practice Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. That's another great stress reliever. Can't do that. Too much close contact. We're doing some Zoom classes. Not the same. And uh, so then I started riding a bike and seeing my family, walking the dogs, bike rides, um, watching a little bit of news, but I have to keep it, you know, within the sanity uh, threshold and uh, you know, working on whatever projects might be next after the final season of uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. airs in May. Well, we're definitely going to get into Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. here in just a second. I want to kind of wind back the clock just a little bit. Talk about a little bit some of your uh, your earlier work, guys. Um, 
one of your earliest writing projects is really one of my all time favorite psychological thrillers is the movie What Lies Beneath. Phenomenal, <laughs> phenomenal film, guys. Um, what uh, what can you tell us about your experience uh, writing that film? One of your earlier uh, writing projects, working with Harrison Ford, uh, Michelle Pfeiffer. Yeah, um, I you know I worked a lot in the theater at the Atlantic Theater Company right out of college. Did about ten years of that in New York, and then started to spend some time in L.A. looking to work more in um, film and TV. And nobody <laughs> nobody was biting at first, so I um, I started working, started writing. You know, I didn't I didn't want to sit around and doing nothing. That's not really me. So I started writing some stuff, and uh, an amazing executive. Um, who's done amazing stuff since like the Hunger Games and a lot of stuff. Nina Jacobson was at DreamWorks and she said, look, I, I like your weird indie that you wrote, but I, I'm interested in this ghost thriller idea that we have. It's like a one sentence idea. And she told me the idea and I was driving across country and by Nebraska, I had a few ideas and I just got really lucky because the amazing Robert Zemeckis walked in a couple of days after I turned in that draft and said, I'm looking for a psychological thriller. And um Next thing you know, I was meeting with him and he became kind of an amazing mentor and really helped me work on the script for eight or nine months. And then he did this incredible thing where he shot the first half of Castaway with Tom Hanks. Um, and then we shot all of What Lies Beneath. And then he shot the other half of Castaway um, where he'd lost all this weight and looked different. And um, I can't remember which part was first. And in the, in the, at the beginnings of The Castaway, we talked about how uh, the professor, Norman, should be someone that no one would ever suspect of doing anything wrong. And so, you know, anyone who's not a Harrison Ford fan, I don't fully understand. But so uh, he sent it to Harrison and Harrison was, yeah, let's do this. I love this. And, um, and Michelle came along very soon after. They were both so incredible and kind. And, and so was Zemeckis, who kept me around during the whole production in Vermont. I had written it. I'd done theater with Atlantic in Burlington, Vermont for many summers. And I'd written it with that town in mind. And they called me. I never told them. And Steve Stark, uh, Robert's production head said, you know, I think we might shoot it in Burlington, Vermont. So already there was some kind of weird psychic energy going on. And it was just a, an incredible experience. And I, I've been friends with Harrison ever since and Michelle whenever I see her. Did you have Harrison Ford and Michelle Pfeiffer in mind as you were writing the scripts or uh, did you ever, was there a casting process or was it just always Harrison and, and, and Michelle? Or, uh, you know. No, I mean, no, I didn't. I didn't ever, you know, I didn't conceive, I didn't conceive of the idea that it was going to get made. <laughs> I was, I just was, it was a fantasy of a psychological thriller that I wanted to see, I thought might be an interesting idea. Um, so I was kind of taken by surprise by all of it. I never, I didn't dream that big, but fortunately, uh, Robert Zemeckis is Robert Zemeckis and he can dream that big. And he, he lined them up and then there was casting of the other roles. The, and uh, I just watched and learned. And it's a beautiful movie. If you guys haven't seen What Lies Beneath, it's an absolute classic of the 1990s. Um, I mean, your acting career spans over like three decades. Roles in daytime, soaps, Young Indiana Jones Chronicles, uh, The Usual Suspects. A lot of people forget that you're in The uh, Usual Suspects, Clear and Present Danger. Uh, besides MCU roles, what uh, what role do fans come up on you on the street and say, hey, I loved you in Indiana Jones? Are there any, uh, any recognizing? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Um, well, those are, you're talking about things where I, you know, I got... You know, hey, do you want to do two days of this? And I'd say, yeah. And especially, I love the script of Usual Suspects, and I really liked they were um, Chris McQuarrie and Brian Singer were these young guys with this amazing project, and uh, they were also kind of new in town. And uh, we talked about a couple of roles. I ended up really cool. People got the really good roles, and I ended up, uh, you know, the surgeon guy who got to talk to the burned up guy, and that was cool. And I'm <laughs> proud to be part of that. So those were all kind of just. Hey, I got a day on something, and and I was happy to do it in L.A. And um, but then the gigs that people come up to me, and I'm always surprised. I would say, uh, I did I did two episodes of Sports Night, Aaron Sorkin's show. Yeah. At the end of that show, where I played this mysterious billionaire who buys the network, and I maybe I'm imagining this, but uh, I have a relationship with Aaron Sorkin that goes back a long time. And I, I feel like he was saying that if the show went one more season, this guy, Calvin Traeger, was gonna be around. There's an astonishing number of Calvin Traeger recognizers out there. I did one episode, like most actors in New York, of Sex in the City, and- You were in Sex in the City, that's people, right. 
I was. I was a. I was a pathological. I was. A, I was a liar on a speed date, who claimed to be a doctor, and but Miranda was lying too. I, whatever. I'm not going to get into it. Um, um, those are the main things that people come up. And uh, New Adventures of Old Christina sitcom I did with uh, Julia Louis Dreyfus a lot. It has its fans. Well, I mean, people remember you from all over uh, your your vast three decades of, of work. I want to talk, obviously, a little bit about the MCU. Um, I mean, in 2008, uh, your first appearance in the MCU, Agent Phil Coulson in the first Iron Man movie. Uh, something fans, I don't think, give Coulson quite enough credit for is that even before that famous Nick Fury uh, post credit se sequence when he uh, announces the in Avengers Initiative, um, you were actually the first person to tease that larger Avengers world when you uttered the word strategic homeland intervention enforcement homeland intervention enforcement you logistics you still division. know it's the Look actually I've never written down. you know it you know it 90% I mean, of shield agents can't say that when you first read that script in Iron Man I mean did you uh did, did that line have any impact in you do you have any idea the doors that would open up uh, not only just in the Avengers world but in the entire film industry um no because that wasn't in there it was very it was very much. I loved. I loved a few comics when I was a kid. Warlock, Iron Man, Iron Fist, especially. And so when I heard they were doing that, and I saw the cast they put together, I was so excited to go see it. And then uh, I got a call that John Favreau, my neighbor from a couple blocks away, um, that there was a, a role of an agent, and I don't think he had a name. He didn't even have a first name agent. Um, maybe he did. Um, but he, uh, and it didn't, I don't know, there was a couple, maybe t two scenes, not much, a couple of lines, but I didn't give, sh I didn't care. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and I signed up for it. I was thrilled. I was sure I was going to be cut out with that amazing cast of actors. But then they, as it went along, they seemed to have a need for this guy. And uh, they liked the kind of snarky repartee. Um, <laughs> they liked watching Tony Stark basically uh, verbally beat him up. And, um, and then uh, as it went along, they kind of gave him more and more stuff to do, include, including one day this piece of dialogue that said strategic homeland, et cetera. And I went, wait a minute, wait a minute, is that my shield? Because up till then, he was just kind of like this knucklehead bureaucrat from a, from a mysterious agency. And then they made it this whole other thing where, oh, that's actually, that's his cover. He actually is a lot more knowledgeable and potent than he might seem. And uh, I mean, to, to this day, I think about that experience and I almost die of geekiness. Um, and then at the end of it, um, Pepper Potts is saying, thank you, Agent Colson. I was like, I got a name. Yeah. I got a name. <laughs> um, well, fanboys in the audience uh, in the theaters just went nuts when you said Strategic Homeland Intervention Enforcement and Logistics Division. We all lost their minds because we yeah. knew what that meant. Uh, the the uh, Colson snowball kept rolling down the hill in Iron Man 2 when uh, you were sitting down with... Um, uh, if Tony Stark, you're in Tony Stark's lab, and you said Nick Fury wants to send me out to New Mexico. Nobody knew what that meant at the time. That it meant, oh God, he's going to go to New Mexico. Me. Really? You didn't know you were going to go get Thor's hammer? You didn't realize that that tied no, into the next Thor movie no, at all? Um, oh no, 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 no. That, that scene, a lot of those scenes. There's, there's, you know, the Robert magic. Sometimes you're not sure what you're going to hear. There's a lot of beautiful improv. I think that's one of the great things that made. He is like Tony Stark. He's not going to stick too closely to the rules, but which makes it a thrilling experience to act with. But definitely, I wasn't quite sure what was coming at me. And then at a certain point, uh, I think Lou D'Esposito, the great Marvel exec, stepped in and said, um, oh, no, he said, OK, so they're going to so tell him you got to go. Tell him you got to go this time. I was like, oh, I don't want to go. Where do I got to go? He said, this was in Iron Man 2, right? So he said, you, you tell him you got to go to New Mexico. I said, oh, OK. Okay, and they're like, okay, we're rolling. And I was like, okay, I'm sorry, I gotta go. I gotta go to New Mexico. And and he says, Lands of Enchantment. And I was like, yeah, okay, good. That was good. Um, damn it, he came up with a really good one. I was like, and, and I didn't have a good one back. Finally, afterwards, I went over to Lou and I said, what's um? I should know this. Just my character would know this. What's in New Mexico? He goes, oh, Thor. Thor's in New Mexico. You can go find Thor's hammer. Did nobody tell you this? After you like, shot the scene. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, after we know in the middle of the scene. Wow. Yeah. Well, we got a lot of questions in the comment section. Um, I want to see if we can field some Q&A from the audience. Uh, Lords of the Lawn Box uh, asks, how emotional was filming the last season of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D.? And I do want to talk a little bit about Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., but uh, how emotional was that last season? 
it was very emotional. Now we had a, to be honest, we had a very strange situation with Agents of Shield, which was a life imitated art from the get go, and that we had a bunch a guy who didn't know a guy who was dead, Clark, <laughs> coming back and with a new team, who some of whom were experienced, and some of whom weren't, and we became a family, and it became a show about family, and we got very close, a lot of us, and. Um, and so we went on this ride, but we also never knew when our family was going to be broken up. And at every season, we wouldn't know uh, until, you know, we'd get find out, oh, oh, yep, they're bringing this back again. Oh, they're bringing this back again. And finally, at the we were pretty clear that the end of season five was going to be it. And the end of season five was Phil Coulson is, is not going to make it. He's going to Tahiti to end his days. He's dying. And uh, and they were the showrunners were pretty clear, like, no, yeah, this is the real thing. I was like, oh, OK, God, this breaks my heart. This guy breaks my heart every couple of years. He breaks my heart. And um, <laughs> and so we had the final episode was called The End. And we had this very tearful goodbye, both on the show and in real life. And and then it was over. And then we got a call saying we actually want to do two more 13 episode seasons. And so I was this other guy who was quite evil until he wasn't. And then this new season coming up. So we had two more seasons over this shot in space about a year. And uh, we were almost goodbyed out by then. But now, I don't know, I, I have to admit, I was at a car parade social distancing birthday party for Chloe Bennett with Elizabeth Henstridge and Jeff Ward and some people the other day. So we're all still very close. Well, Tina uh, Marie asked in the comment section, Clark, can you describe season seven's uh, Phil Phil Philinda? In three words. Um, Tough boy, that's a tricky today. one. Um, <laughs> lots of baggage. There it is. <laughs> now, we got so many people uh, in the audience. I want to ask one qu last question for myself. Uh, in season six, you played Sarge. A uh, much darker version of Agent Coulson. What was it like bringing that uh, darker side of the character, actually getting to fight some, some people that, you know, your co-star is getting... What was, what was that experience like, kind of flipping the script on the personality of Coulson? Boy, it was really fun. It was really fun to be the, this kind of mysterious bad guy who's murderous and has no... Sh has nothing to give that might be bad. I don't know what to say. I have... My, my language hasn't gotten better in quarantine. Um, it was really freeing. You know, Coulson is always walking a very careful moral line while having to do very practical, ruthless things. This guy's just about the ruthless because he had a bigger purpose in mind that was kind of surprising, a lot of secrets. And it, it was interesting to be at odds with, it was a very different Felinda. She was shooting me a lot, um, to be at odds with all the people that I had worked so closely with. Okay, we got another question here in the comment section. Josh, Joshua uh, Palace says, huge fan, Mr. Greg. Uh, your adaptation of Choke was a total masterpiece. Uh, would you be interested in adapting other novels to film? Thank you, Joshua. Clearly a genius. Um, I loved directing Choke. I loved how it turned out. Chuck Palahniuk who, Palahniuk, who you have on here, is one of the greatest people and one of the most interesting writers I've ever come across. Um, I had an amazing experience doing that. Yeah, I'd love to do, adapt something. I'm working on some original stuff right now um, and adapting a true story from the news. But uh, book adaption, adaptations are really tricky, but really, really rewarding if you can get them right. Yeah. yeah. And I, I'll never forget getting a hold of the rights to that kind of sought after book just by luck and being very frozen for a moment by how much great writing was in it and how much great dialogue. And my first conversation with the generous and amazing Chuck Palahniuk was, he said, look, just don't be too faithful to the book. And I was like, wow. Okay. Wow. That that's guy's, rare. That's interesting. And it totally <laughs> freaked me up. Yeah. Yeah. Just do whatever you want to do. Uh, so, I mean, it's an obvious question. Are we ever going to see Agent Coulson on the big screen? Before I get to that question, I'll let you think about that question for just a second. Um, Captain Marvel, nobody really thought we'd see uh, Agent Coulson back on the big screen until Captain Marvel came out and you played a much younger Phil Coulson. Was was there any de-aging technology or was that all just makeup and your own handsome face? Was there any anything digital going on there? That's really that's a sweet and hilarious <laughs> question, Chuck. Um, yeah, no, I just went to a spa for the weekend. <laughs> uh, no, um, there was a lot. I think most of the budget was spent trying to make me look 20 years younger. 
Um, yeah, we had dots. <laughs> we had dots on our face. It can be told. Um, mine were black, Sam's were white, which was kind of funny. It was like that episode of Star Trek, the original, um, where one guy's half black and one guy's half, anyway. Um, and we would do the scenes and then later they would just do their magic to us. That technology has come a long way. And uh, oh, some crazy wigs, um, <laughs> me especially. And, uh, and then bingo, all of a sudden we were walking out of a blockbuster in the 90s. Yeah, and then all, you've got wonderful new Instagram uh, profile pictures from that too. I mean, just you know, you just de-age yourself on social exactly. media like fifty years. I um, look amazing, people. You look great. Uh, so, any oh, let's go back to my original question. Any chance that we might see Agent Coulson on the big screen ever again? Maybe Captain Marvel two. Um, you know, so far in the MCU. You know, there was the Marvel Television MCU. They were not super crossing over. At first, that was the big pitch on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., but they definitely kind of went separate directions for a minute. Um, the only return of Coulson has not has been pre-Avengers, so they haven't dealt with Coulson being alive in the MCU. As of yet, um, they've certainly got a lot of uh, fascinating characters that they're exploring now. I never say never because, uh, you know, it's the world of the comics. And they have alternate realities and timelines. And, you know, I'll always be happy if I get a call from them. But I also feel very grateful for the ride that I've had there. Absolutely. Well, guys, we have a few more minutes. Uh, if you have any questions, leave them in the chat. Um, something I wanted to ask you, you brought up uh, season one of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. How much has that show evolved? Like, how different is it now than when you first started? I mean, what was the original plan for the show? And then can you point to a specific season, a specific episode where they said, OK, we're going to, for lack of a better term, flip the script and go in a completely other direction. Like how, how much has that show changed? That's a, that's a really good question. I mean, it was a pilot uh, written by Joss, directed by Joss, and then Joss went off and did Age of Ultron. And, uh, you know, his very talented brother and uh, brother's wife, uh, Marissa, they're a great writing team on their own. Uh, they took it over with Jeff Bell and got an amazing team of writers. and. They, they took on the really formidable task of how do you bring Marvel, essentially, S.H.I.E.L.D. to ABC weekly one hour with commercial breaks and kind of standalone episodes. And it was uh, definitely, you know, it's been talked about a lot. There was definitely some moments where they were trying to find their footing, all of us, how to make that work, you know, and they're standing up against these incredible movies and at the same time, um, at the same time, if you look back at season one, they also had this secret they had to hold out, which is they couldn't mention Hydra until Winter Soldier. And they had this big crossover, like two thirds of the way through the season. And some of the stuff with Bill Paxton and the way it shifts at the end, I'm very, very proud of. And I'm really proud of the show it became. Certainly as the show went along, ABC was really let us become more the dark noir -y show we wanted to be. I think it was season four when they did three separate pods, they called them, um, and really let it be more like runs of the comics. And from there, I, I really stand in awe of the way the writers of the show, every season would just tear it down to the studs and start over with a different thing. Oh, now Colson Sarge. Now we're in the future. This coming up season, we are doing some time traveling. And uh, there you go. With some very interesting missions that might even involve uh, Say it. helping people who might one day become Hydra. Uh, excellent. Any tie-ins to uh, any of the Loki stuff? Uh, anything you can say? <laughs> Probably not. I don't want to pry. No. The only thing that's been revealed that I'm allowed to talk about is we might run into some S.H.I.E.L.D. agents from different time periods. Cool. Well, you got we one more question. Into some people. Rel yeah, sorry. That's it. No, no, no. Um, I, wow, I totally interrupted you at the wrong, wrong time. No, no. <laughs> we got a... Uh, like some... Yeah, yeah. Oh, man. I'm, I'm... <laughs> People in the chat are hating I me right now. What I was going to say, I would have just gotten myself killed. Okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, last one comes from Downright Nerdy Podcast. Uh, thank you for the Super Chat donations. I'll go into charity. He said, thank you, Mr. Greg, for taking the time for doing this. We are huge fans and couldn't be prouder to be fans of yours now. Thank you for spending some time with us. For the great cause, hope you and your family are staying safe. That comes from Downright Nerdy Podcast. That's very, very kind, Downright Nerdy Podcast. My family and I are staying very safe. We're, we're playing by the rules. Um, it's a very strange time. I mean, come on. Anyone who 
goes to a comic book store or watches the stuff I watch, you can't help but see the weird dystopian thing we're living through. And I don't know, I kind of, I think it's a good time for a new season of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. because it's all about how we come together and recognize our connectedness is going to be how we get through this. Not a bad so, time yes. for some time travel either. <laughs> Not bad, no. Well, Clark, thanks so much for taking your time for doing this. We really, really appreciate it. Donating your time for charity. Couldn't thank you enough. Uh, really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. You're welcome, guys. We've got a lot more mainframe Comic-Con. Two whole days worth, as a matter of fact, live from Chicago Comics in the heart of the Windy City. Stick around. We got uh, After this commercial break, we've got the, the cast of AMC's Nosferatu, Joe Hill, Jakar Smith, showrunner, Jamie O'Brien. Lots of great stuff, guys. So stick around. We'll be back in about five minutes. Chicago Comics is the premier comic and collectible shop located in the heart of the Windy City. Founded in 1991, Chicago Comics brings a large and comprehensive comic book selection to collectors of all ages. Chicago Comics specializes in small press and hard-to-find indie comic titles and carries almost all available superhero titles and tons of merchandise. Toys and statues, clothing, and collectibles, Chicago Comics has everything you are looking for and a whole lot more. Whether you're a hardcore collector, casual fan, or weekly reader, you'll find what you're looking for at Chicago Comics. Open seven days a week. Stop by Chicago Comics, 3244 North Clark Street, in the heart of Chicago's Lakeview neighborhood. Or check them out online at chicagocomics.com. Are we on? No, oh, hey guys, welcome back to Mainframe Comic Con, broadcasting live from Chicago Comics here in the heart of the Windy City. Uh, that was a lot of fun sitting down with Mr. Clark Gregg. Joining us right now, really, really excited about this one, guys. Um, incredibly excited to introduce the cast and creators of one of my favorite returning shows on AMC, the Supernatural Horror Nosferatu. Joining us here, if I am seeing correct, we got Mr. Joe Hill. How you doing there, Joe? <laughs> there he is. There's Joe. How's it going, man? It's good to see you again, by the way. Last time we saw you was in good Chicago. Man, I wish I was in that shop right now. Have a look at it. Man, this is Chicago Comics. Absolutely. If you're ever in the Windy City, stop by Chicago Comics. I can almost see Wrigley Field from where I'm sitting. Um, I'm also on the comic stores, man. I'm yeah. missing comic stores. We got really lucky. They opened the doors and then closed them and locked them right behind us as soon as we walked in to broadcast this. Um, if you're I want to introduce out of a pandemic. Who doesn't want to be hermetically sealed in the comics? It's fun, of all the places to be. Hey, look who it is! Hey. Star Nosferatu. We've got uh, Jakar oh, Smith, hey. Jamie O'Brien. How's everybody doing? Good, right. good. Can't complain. How's, yeah, er can. how's everybody doing on uh, social quarantine? <laughs> um. It's actually, it's probably like the most consecutive sleep I've ever gotten in my life. <laughs> like to be 100%. I'm just like, it went very quickly from like, oh, I hate being at home to, oh, I'm so lucky I have a home. So like at this point, anytime I start getting bored, I'm just like, shut up. <laughs> Go sit down somewhere <laughs> on your furniture that you have because you're blessed. <laughs> Looks like you've been painting the walls a little bit, Chikara. Oh, yeah. I have a couple pieces from my friends up there. And then I have a couple. Actually, when we were filming season two, me and my best friend started doing this thing called Inktober. But we did uh, watercolor paints instead of ink where, like, they just throw a word out on social media and you just do your interpretation of that. And it helps a lot with the wintertime. So. Dakar, you're really good. 
Thank I've you. Seen, I've seen some of the stuff on Instagram. It's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Joe's so nice. He's like my biggest hype man. <laughs> Anytime I feel like I can't do something, I think of him and his wife like hyping me up. I'm like, <laughs> and then I grew up like six times bigger. Jamie, how you doing? I'm doing good. You know, can't complain. We're um, healthy and lucky enough to still kind of be working from home. So um, we're doing good. It's nice here, sunny. <laughs> um, yeah. It's pretty nice. Awesome. Well, we're all so excited about season two of Nosferatu. Premieres on AMC and the BBC America um, Monday nights, I believe, or is the premiere the premiere yeah, uh, Sunday? It's changed to Sunday. So originally it was um, June first, which was going to be Monday nights at ten, and now um, they've pushed it to June twenty first, which is a Sunday, and we're going to be on Sunday nights at nine. All right, Sunday, yeah, the June twenty first. Begged us to move to Sunday because they were like, "We can't have you killing our Monday night programming like that." You know, exactly. Already, so we, we were like, "All right." <laughs> Sunday is not a bad time slot. I actually think it's a better time slot, so I'm not complaining about it. I'm a little disappointed because I'm so excited for people to see the season. So I was like bumped out that we had to push it off for three weeks. But nine o'clock, I think, is better than ten o'clock. It worked for Game yeah. of Thrones. Yeah, so. <laughs> the X Files had the X Files had the Sunday night slot in their best years. Then they got bumped to Thursday, and everyone stopped watching. Oh uh, yeah, I don't, know why, I don't know why I remember that. I just do. Well, Joe, last time we had you on, you gave us a little bit of a tease of season two of Nosferatu. You said it's bigger, it's crazier, it's more insane. Jamie, I want to ask you a question for those people out there who haven't seen uh, the first season of Nosferatu. I want to do completely spoiler free, but uh, kind of get people up to speed uh, on what uh, the basic synopsis of the show is, and kind of where you're at right now going into season two. Oh, okay. Um, so in season one, we kind of, we meet everybody, right? We meet the players in season one. We meet a man called Charlie Makes. We discover what he's up to, which isn't any good. Um, and we meet our protagonist, Vic McQueen, and we meet Maggie Lee. Um, and we kind of set the stage and who has what power and what they're all after. And basically there's this guy named Charlie Makes who has a car that runs on human souls instead of gasoline. And as it kind of runs on souls, it, it, it replenishes him. So it takes the souls from whatever um, child he happens to have in the back seat and kind of uses it to run and also to like repower Charlie makes. So um, Maggie is the first person who kind of realizes what he's up to and that he's um, operating in the world when he takes a neighbor of hers. And she has a magical Scrabble bag um, that gives her the answers to the universe. And uh, so she asks the Scrabble bag, how do I stop this guy? And the Scrabble bag answers the brat, which is the nickname, of course, of Vic McQueen. So that's how those two kind of come together, determined to chase after Charlie makes. They learn his weaknesses, they go after him, and there's a showdown at the end of season one in which Vic kind of, I would say, wins the battle but not the war. Um, mm. Stops him, but he is, she has not, she has not killed him. Um, and so, and also when we leave season one, Vic McQueen is pregnant. Um, so when we come back in season two, there's an eight year time jump. Guess what Charlie makes is, going to figure out a way to come back at Vic and now she has a son so the stakes are much higher um and because everybody kind of already knows how how the world operates everything happens much quicker um makes knows who Vic is knows what her powers are knows how to defeat her knows what her weakness is um and the same thing Vic knows who makes is Maggie knows how to, you know, she already knows that the, the key to destroying him is to destroy the wraith. So they kind of go at each other right off, right off the bat. I'm getting excited. Uh, so before we it's go any like, further, go ahead, Joe. kind of like, even though we jump ahead eight years, do you remember how on Halloween 2, like Michael Myers got right off the uh, gurney and started killing people like in the first, like, two minutes of the, the, the film? It's kind of like that. I mean, it really, you know, when we pick things up, it's the, you know, the... We're already moving 100 miles an hour. Well, I understand we have a clip where we have some uh, we have some trailers that we're going to show to all of our. We got a lot of people, a lot of Nosferatu fans. We're hitting us up on social media, getting really, really excited uh, about clip. seeing you guys and talking to you guys. By the way, um, if you guys are in the chat, you have any questions, we're going to opening it uh, up uh, towards the end of the panel for some uh, live Q&A for all you fans out there. But Chad, do we have the the the, the trailers queued up? 
There are a lot of bad people in the world. And Charlie Manx is one of them. I'll admit I underestimated you. I will stop you even if it kills you. That's a promise. <laughs> Did everyone get the sound? Yeah, yo. I have the sound. I got sound. sound sound For some reason. Hmm. Oh wow, it looks good. It's good. It sounds good. (laughs) It sounds fantastic. I mean, yeah, like I was saying, Joe, when you we last saw you, you said it's harder, it's it's scarier, it's crazier, and it certainly looks that way. Uh uh from that. Jakar, I want to ask you some questions. Yeah. I don't want to embarrass you. Okay, but we, we did have Joe on the show a little while ago, and he said, and I quote, Jakar is a breakout star. She completely dazzles in the show. Oh, Don't cr- <laughs> what a sweetie, right? No, when I said he's my biggest hype man, like I was not lying. He's so nice. Everyone has been so nice and so welcoming, and I was terrified because it was my first job. I was like, I'm going to suck, and everybody's going to know that I suck. And I was like, oh, but everyone was so nice. Like, anytime I had a question, anytime I was worried, people were there with, like, encouragement and things that they had learned, both business-wise and set-wise. And it was just it was really a cool experience. I, any kind of, like, success I attain here is because I have really good support system. Well, you're instant it's fan good. favorite, man. I mean, people absolutely, especially what a creepy effect when you reach into that Scrabble bag and your arm disappears. Oh, that is just yes. that's, that. Well done, Jamie, and your special effects yes. team. That just looks awesome. Yes. Um, Mag, what, what can you tell us about Maggie Lee and uh, sort of her character in season one, but more importantly, kind of her her her, her journey in season two? So I think a lot of uh, Maggie's situation in season two pertains to her having attained what she's kind of lacked her whole life. Her whole thing has been, I want a family. She had Joe and then unfortunately, you know, the Christmas land kids got a hold of them. She had Vic and then Vic was like, I can't stay here. And in season one, we see her left off with Tabitha to hunt Bing. And that's kind of flourished into like this really beautiful relationship where she's got the stability she's always wanted, but she's still not satiated. And I feel like that speaks to a lot of people, especially when they've gone through their 20s, is like thinking you know exactly what you want and chasing after it relentlessly, falling back to like bad coping mechanisms when you can't attain it. And then when you finally get this thing that you've put on a pedestal for so long, it's not as satisfying as you thought it was. So I think a lot of season two has to do with whether or not she wants to stay with where she's been left off or if she... Uh, wants to go searching further. That's all I'm going to say. Oh, I just saw somebody put up a comment saying how amazingly wonderful you are. Um, the, question, the, big shocking spoiler, the big shocking spoiler is actually Maggie runs Charlie Manx down in the first 15 minutes of episode one yeah. with the Trans Am. And then the next nine episodes, her and Vic play Scrabble. <laughs> I've watched that show. Did not see that coming. <laughs> Well, I want to ask you, I mean, a, sort of a side question for uh, for Jamie and Joe. What fans of the novel uh, pretty much caught on right away and what fans of the show might not realize is really the first season of the show is only the first piece of the book. There's so much more story to tell, yeah. right? Um, I mean, Jamie, was this something that you got, you knew you wanted to do uh, when you first, because I mean, you're the showrunner of the whole show. Did you know you were only going to do half of it? Did you, could, did you instantly see multiple seasons out of that first, out of just the novel? Absolutely. You know, um, part of me thought, well, if I don't get through the whole book, AMC will have to pick up another season. Um, yeah. I'm mostly kidding about that. Um, but yeah, I, you know, if for, for fans of the book, I think like the first third of the book is a lot about Vic's, about Vic and her home life. It also goes into Manx and Bing. Um, but the, the part of it for the show that I was really interested in was just really getting to know Vic. Um, and her kind of coming of age story, which I thought was really beautiful in the book. Uh, and she kind of, the first time she encounters Charlie Manx is about a third of the way in. And, um, you know, we wanted to kind of move that up because we thought, you know, it's a television show and there are two main characters. We got to kind of get them together quicker. But I still thought that that um, break point, uh, there's actually a time jump in the book as well. Uh, so we've kind of, we've, 
we've kind of followed along um, what Joe laid out for us. Yeah, that's yeah. I mean, I remember working on the book, and I got there's a confrontation at a gas station, and I got to it, and I thought, finally, I'm going to end this book. And then <laughs> I got done with the scene, and I said, "Oh shit, I don't even think I'm halfway." <laughs> I thought I was done. And it's such an exciting moment in the book. Like, um, it's the introduction of Luke Carmody, who's such yes! a Luke. And um, that gas station scene is harrowing and terrifying. And it also is, um, it's the moment where you realize just how brave and courageous Vic McQueen is and Luke Carmody. Like both of them, neither of them has a chance against this supernatural vampire, um, but they fling themselves at him because yeah. they're trying to protect a kid that they don't even know that's in the backseat of this wraith. And it's, um, I remember reading it and I was like, oh, I just love this girl. And um, yeah, and, and, and then it takes off from there because as Vic says to Maggie, spoiler alert in our first episode she says we didn't finish the job uh he's still out there and we gotta i don't think he's dead and i think we have more work to do how much of a time jump is there between season one and season two because i mean vic obviously in season two she has her child right i mean so how many years are we are we looking at eight years wow really yeah so who, who did we cast for uh young uh mcqueen jr his name is Jason David, and um, I can't wait for you guys to see him because he's awesome. He's great. He's, he's so the great. greatest kid. He's so he's such a good kid, and he's really yeah. smart and just really kind and sweet and funny. Um, and it was funny by the time we were shooting the finale, he was um, he was directing the whole thing. Like I remember <laughs> uh, Ashley coming to place Vic had a question about you know. Well, am I caught? Where do I think he is? And he, I just remember him walking up to Ashley and being like, "Listen, I've done this, and you want to know that, so you're trying to get me to like." He just like and she was like, "Well, okay." Um, and we, but we were all kind of uh, delighted by it as well because he is getting to know his way around the set. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, Jakara, speaking of uh, Ashley, Ashley's not here with. I mean, we see photos of you and Ashley on red carpets. You guys look like you really get along. You look like you're really good friends. So, what's your experience working with Ashley Cummings, who plays Vic McQueen uh, in the show, uh, both both on camera and off camera? Oh, dude, she's great. I mean, I think she's fantastic. She is really, really good actress, like insanely good, and she's so in touch with her emotions, which is a huge part, I think, of our job or being able to do our job as authentically as we can. And um, it's easy to talk about difficult scenes with her. Like, it's easy to talk about uncomfortable moments between them. It's easy to talk about how to navigate those as people who have to, like, look each other in the eye after it's done. Like, throwing up all over her in season one uh, <laughs> was not as difficult as I thought it was going to be because <laughs> both were just, like, I was like, this shit is awesome. I'm sorry. And she's like, oh, it's great. Like, when you do it, like, project. She was like, throw your head back. And it was like, great. It's like you put two toddlers together in a room with a bunch of shit they're not supposed to have. That's like what you get with us two. <laughs> one of the reasons why it's so good, I think. Like, And I think that's one of the reasons that Vic and Maggie's relationship translates well is because we're friends in real life. Jamie, what's the movie magic behind projectile vomiting on set? Is it is it literally just a mouthful of fluid or is there something more to it? Is there a chemical I, I, involved? I think in, in Maggie's case last season, it was literally a mouthful of fluid. Okay. Yeah, we we the bag again this year a little differently. Um, yeah. I won't give it away. <laughs> one of the one of the biggest changes between the show and the book is in the show, you know, Maggie and Vic are really co-equal heroes. Um, and and I've been trying, I've been working out in my head, I've been trying to figure out who they metaphorically compare to. Um, Maggie is kind of like if Hermione Granger um, had a drug habit and was into self harm. <laughs> And, and Vic is kind of like like if if Buffy the Vampire Slayer had more of Vin Diesel's personality from Fast and the Furious. Wow, the author speaks. <laughs> <laughs> oh. They're a great Butch and Sundance pair, though. And and Jamie really leaned into that in the second season. There's a lot of great moments where. The two of them are battling together, and I thought, "Shit, I wish I, were, I wish I had put them side by side like this in the book," you know. But that's the thing about with with 
you know, with an adaptation is you get a chance to make things even to punch things up and make things even more exciting. I just saw a really good comment that just popped up on the screen from uh, from Marvelous. Sorry to cut you off, Jamie. Sorry, your face is uh, not seen right now. But from Marvelous Adventures of T and G. Thank you for the super chat donation, by the way. Uh, writes Joe, we've been getting some. Uh, consistent visual content based on your stories like Nosferatu, uh, In the Tall Grass, Lock and Key. What untapped content will we see in live action from you in the future? Next up is, so the pandemic has curtailed filming of really everything. Um, but no one need despair. Um, I'm going to do the second season of Lock and Key solo with sock puppets on Zoom. Oh, and we'll call it Sock and Key. <laughs> Well, but I want to get back to Nosferatu, of course. Very good. <laughs> Joe, Joe, what's your... Um... I'm so proud of that. I'm, I'm so proud of that. <laughs> you worked on that one. I like it. <laughs> I've watched that show. What, uh, what's your involvement on the show in Nosferatu as far as... Uh, I know you're a producer on the show, Joe. Um, are you involved at all in sort of um, the creative process on the screen? Or are you just is that just all Jamie, 100%? I, a lot of it is Jamie. A lot of it is Jamie, for sure. You know, she has a great team of writers. I mean, the thing is, is like, it's almost like writer's room code, but like no one is really allowed to, you know, you sort of don't, you know, uh, um, you don't talk about what happens in the writer's room. <laughs> but Jamie is, you know, Jamie is, you know, um, um, she is, she is everyone's compass. Um, she knows what direction we're heading in. And, and, um, and she had worked with a tremendous team, Tom Brady, you know, Jamie, you want to, I mean, uh, uh, you want to, you know, um, reel off some of the other writers because we really worked with the killers team you know murderers yeah wrote. yeah joe joe's being a little um he's being a little modest he did he did come into our writer's room in season two at the top for uh we were lucky because he was in town for comic-con so um we did have the opportunity to, to to pick his brain a little bit and i think we got um a great new character out of it uh, who I'm excited for you guys to meet. I think we meet him in episode three. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I mean, he's, he, his imagination is so big um, that it's like we'd be dumb not to invite him in as much as we can. Um, so he's a little more involved than he, than he just said. Um, and now I forget the question that you asked me. I'm sorry. <laughs> who were the, who else do we work with? It was Tom Brady. Who's the oh, rest right. of the world? The writers. Tom Brady, who was an executive producer on the show this season um, and is a phenomenal writer. I met him on Hell on Wheels, um, and we worked together for a long time. And um, he's super talented. He writes a lot of our big action episodes. Um, and, then, uh, and then a pile of playwrights, really. Um, Lucy Thurber, who, who is a brilliant American playwright. Um, uh Megan Mosin Brown, she's our co-executive producer. She worked both Tom, Megan, and Lucy were all on season one. Um, Megan is a phenomenal, they're all just phenomenal writers. And then this season we added Ray Pamatmot, who's a playwright, and Loy Webb, who is a Chicago-based playwright. Um, and yeah, it's a great mix. Um and a lot of fun to work with. They I, did I, some really inventive, they did some really inventive stuff with the scripts this year, you know, um, in particular episode five. Is it, I think it's episode five. I, I don't, want, don't want to say anything about it because I don't want to have spoilers, but it does this kind of Rashomon thing where you keep seeing the same scene, but from different points of view and discovering whole new bits of information that change everything you saw in the scene before. You know, Wizard was everything. inspired by the book, Joe. That that section of the book you is written in that way. And um, at the beginning of season two, I, I Joe has this beautiful way in the book of a, a, a thing that takes about ten minutes. He'll kind of tell it from different characters' points of view, and in a way that you're getting new information every time you're hearing it. And um, I, that was another thing that I loved about the book. So this season at the beginning of the year, I was like, let's do that. Can we just do that? Um, Cause my goal is basically like whatever work Joe has already done is work we don't have to do. So, um, so we embrace that. That's where that came from. Jakara. So besides the projectile vomiting and stuff, do you have, can you point to one uh, scene from at least from season one that you enjoyed most uh, in shooting or maybe something from season two that you just had a really good time with? I think that the wraith chase 
in season one was pretty fun because they had like the cars like they the the more we sort of blocked it out the more they were adding for me to do because they're like okay well are you comfortable with this are you comfortable with this it was just fun because it was like some tomb raider shit yeah. and i was like let's go i was like that is a beast and then she gets hit by the car and i was like never mind and <laughs> in season two it was probably um I do have a favorite scene in season two, but I cannot talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're excited to see it. Maggie gets to square up, basically. She gets oh, to step sweet. up a little bit. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. She nice. Gets, yeah. Jamie, so I mean, I'm always interested in hearing about uh, sort of the behind the scenes production of uh, shows, especially like Nosferatu. What can you tell us about uh, sort of the behind the scenes, the production of the show? Where is it shot? Uh, how much is in studio? How much is on scene? Was there actually a, a, a bridge? Uh, yeah, there is a bridge. There's um, so we shoot in Rhode Island, um, and mostly actually on location. Uh, it's a very heavy location show, especially in season two. Um, in season one, we had a couple of home sets, uh, which we have in season two. We're just never there. Um, one of them actually is the bridge, and uh, what's cool about the bridge is that it is. There's three, there's three practical pieces to the bridge. There's an entrance, there's an exit, and we can bring those around with us to various locations. And then there's a middle that's about 150 feet long that's on our stage. And, um, and then everything is kind of connected through VFX. So, um, and, and you know, the bats are added in VFX, the static is added in VFX, and we kind of make the bridge sometimes really like double its length in VFX. Um, but I would say it's two thirds practical and um, and one third VFX, the bridge. And we're going to see more of Christmas Land this year uh, as well. And last season, Christmas Land was really the only thing that was practical in Christmas Land were the gates, and everything else was digital. Mm. Um, which we had an amazing. VFX team, and we do again this year. Um, we do have more practical Christmas land this year, and we also have more VFX Christmas land. So it's kind of like it's gotten larger in scope, both in ter like in terms of what was real and what we're still building actually now. There's well, a location within Christmas land that's like one of the coolest things in the whole season. There's, I, you know, um, Jamie and Jakar know what I'm talking about, I think. It, we, find um, it, we spend some time there in the in the very late episodes, very close to the end, and and one in particular where I just I just I I could have had a whole episode set there. It's great. Well, let's see what we got going on in the chat room. Chat, we got um I see one right here from uh, Metal God two four one zero zero. This question is for Jamie. Uh, how did you? Oh, oh, just went away. Uh, how do you think Ashley's character will change now in season two since Vic has a son, and will he have uh, power also? Um, you know, I think that one of the ways in which, so season one, I think for Vic is really kind of a coming of age story, right? She starts off as a kid, kind of not knowing what she's going to do with herself. When she first meets Maggie, she's, Maggie's like, you've got this power, help me. And she's like, nah, I think I'm going to go to art school. Um, and by the end of season one, she's kind of, um, she's embraced who she is as a strong creative, but she has gone through a lot of trauma. She lost her um, love in the back of the wraith. She um, defeated Charlie Manx kind of, but not really. And so when we meet her in season two, she is older. She's um, more world weary. Um, she is still, I think, grappling with the trauma that she experienced at the hands of Charlie Manx in season one. She doesn't really have everything together. What she does have is um, a very loving family. She's with Luke Carmody, and um, and she has a son who she, you know, obviously loves very much. And so the stakes are higher for her, uh, and she is. I would say, what she learns in season one is that she, or in season two, is she kind of has to put aside uh, all of her own damage to be able to protect her son. Good stuff. So next she's, question, come. go ahead, Joe. She's really emotionally and psychologically damaged, like everyone who worked on season one in the Rhode Island winter. <laughs> yeah. 
We got a question from uh, where would it go? Ah, there it goes. Richard Evans. Uh, did the Wraith graphic novel have much influence on how you made Christmas Land look? Good question. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yes. I made everybody read it. <laughs> how many wraiths are there? Uh, how hard was it to, to track down all of these uh, Rolls Royces? Do you have there, a whole team of them? There are two wraiths that um, that are wraiths, <laughs> that are real wraiths. And then we have a stunt wraith um, that is actually, I think it's an old Ford that's dressed up like a wraith. Um, because it turns out that 80-year-old cars aren't really good at doing stunts. So they're not real good at peeling out. They don't actually go very fast. Um, <laughs> and, and it's funny, you, know, you mentioned the Trans Am. The day that we have a Trans Am in season two that we use for like one episode. And I was like, this car is awesome. Because uh, <laughs> it, it's just... It's a muscle car. It's not an it's not an eighty year old antique, and so it was just so much cooler to be able to like zip around and do stuff with. Um, but the race is beautiful. There is a suggestion in the book that actually Charlie Manx is evil Michael Knight from Knight Rider. Yes. <laughs> there is at least a faint suggestion that maybe there's a a, a, a sinister streak of Hasselhoff in it. <laughs> Jakara, we got a, a question from uh, Shauna R. Does Vic get a new bridge in season two? Uh, no. No. Uh, <laughs> not what I know of. I'm pretty sure it's the same bridge. Same bridge, new ride. Yeah, it's yeah. Ah, new ride. Yeah, yeah. 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 So. Soups up the old, uh, goes from the dirt bike to a hog, Supposed if I'm not mistaken. To a Triumph Bonneville, a 68 Triumph Bonneville. And you know, what's funny is when I worked on the book, I always thought if it was a movie or a TV show based on the book, Triumph would give me a motorcycle. Like, as thanks for the free advertising. So How, far, how's that? No, they haven't reached out to you yet? Nothing, not a thing. No, you know what? It's probably just the pandemic. It's backing everything up. The letter is coming in the mail. Yeah. Just give it time until all this clears up. Just give it time. I wouldn't say no. If they, if they delivered a brand new, you know, a brand new Triumph, it's not like I'd reject it. Here you go, Jakar from Chuck Green. I had a hard time watching her getting hit by the wraith. I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was hilarious. Uh, Jamie, for you, got a question in the chat. When will the full trailer drop? That's a great question. There were plans to drop it early, like before now, but now that we've pushed our air date, I think that, um, you know, I think that it's up in the air a little bit, but I don't, maybe next week. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know more. I feel it's it's a little, um, there's a little rethinking just because we're, we're not airing as quickly. So things are, they're waiting a little bit. All right, guys. Well, we got to wrap it up. We have got uh, more great guests here at Mainframe Comic Con. Jamie O'Brien, Joe Hill, uh, Jakar Smith. Guys, Nosferatu hits uh, your homes June 21st. Sunday, June 21st, and we may get a trailer within a week from now, if, if Jamie is to believe. Jamie believed. practically promised, so now <laughs> it has to happen. Yeah. <laughs> if it doesn't show up, you can send the complaint letters to Joe. Yay. All right, guys. <laughs> well, guys, definitely check out Nosferatu. Uh, episodes, I think, are streaming right now on the AMC uh, Network app, so check out. Get caught up on Season 1, and Season 2 drops uh, really, really soon. Thanks a lot for being here, guys. Really appreciate it. Hey guys, you guys, we got a lot more stuff right like here from uh, Chicago Comics coming up next it, from Game of Thrones star Nathalie Emanuel with the great Jay Washington from Collider Movie Talk from YouTube. You know Jay. I'm seeing him right now. You guys can't see him. He's smiling. He can't wait to hang out with you guys. So stick around just a couple minutes. Mr. Jay Washington and the beautiful Nathalie Emanuel will be back in just a sec. There are a lot of bad people in the world. And Charlie Manx is one of them. I'll admit I underestimated you. I will stop you even if it kills you. It's a promise. Nosferatu. Think of me at Christmas time. Won't you? Nosferatu. Clean. Oh, you got a random all cat. <laughs> Hey, Mainframe Comic Con. I'm Josh Blaylock, the founder.
Hey, Mainframe Comic Con. I'm Josh Blaylock, the founder and publisher of Devil's Due Comics and the creator of the comic book series Arc World, a brand new series which happens to have an exclusive variant cover just for Mainframe. It's available right now over at the merch section. Part of it goes to charity. Everything's for a good cause. Uh, I hope you go check it out. I think you'll like it. And I just want to say thanks again to Mainframe for welcoming us to the show. And I hope everyone's having a great time. Hey there, from Philadelphia. Hey everybody, it's Amber from Miami Beach. Hey guys, Steven here from Team Comic Con Africa. Hello, from Philadelphia. Hello from Boston. Hello and much love from Seattle. Hello from Manchester. Hello from New York. Hey from New York. Hi everyone from New York City. Hello from Chicago. What's up from Miami? Hello from Chicago. Hey from New York. Saying hello from Seattle. Hey from New York. Greetings from Los Angeles. Hey guys, it's Lance with Read Pop. Just want to remind you that we're all fans too here at Read Pop and we miss you guys. We're super excited that as soon as we can to start building awesome shows for you again, whether it's New York Comic Con, Emerald City Comic Con, PAX, Star Wars Celebration, we're ready to go. We'll see you soon, I hope. What's up, everyone? So this guy just came to my house and he's like, hey, I'll trade you an amazing Spider-Man number 121 for all your toilet paper, all your food, and your Nintendo Switch. This Corona stuff is getting crazy. I, I, I swear to God, I'm following him right now to make sure it doesn't pester anyone else. He went down that way, to the right by the railroad tracks. Yeah, this is getting crazy. Chicago Comics is the premier comic and collectible shop located in the heart of the Windy City. Founded in 1991, Chicago Comics brings a large and comprehensive comic book selection to collectors of all ages. Chicago Comics specializes in small press and hard to find indie comic titles and carries almost all available superhero titles and tons of merchandise. Toys and statues, clothing and collectibles, Chicago Comics has everything you are looking for and a whole lot more. Whether you're a hardcore collector, casual fan, or weekly reader, you'll find what you're looking for at Chicago Comics. Open seven days a week, stop by Chicago Comics 3244 North Clark Street in the heart of Chicago's Lakeview neighborhood. Or check them out online at chicagocomics.com. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Chumpcast. I am Smithers with another weekly update on all things pop culture. During these unprecedented times, we try to keep a man in the field, and that man is Mark. Mark, can we get an update? Thanks, Smithers. I'm here right now in downtown California, just got in off the 405, and as you can see, it is a ghost town out here. No word yet as to when Batman is going to save us from this post-apocalyptic... <laughs> post this post, dude, I told you to leave that word off the f***ing script. What were you thinking? Uh, thanks for nothing, Mark. Brick, can you save the segment? Yeah, oh, no, no. Save the segment? No, zero. This has been the Chumpcast. We may hate each other, but we love being nerds. Hey everybody, what's happening? Welcome to Mainframe Comic Con. It is me, your resident supervillain, Mr. J. Washington. I'm happy to be here. I'm in Los Angeles, but they're doing this from my hometown of Chicago, if you can't tell. I'm representing it to the fullest right now, but you're not really here to see me, are you? No. So let's get this underway. I have an amazing guest that I'm honored to be here talking to today. Of course, you all know her from the Game of Thrones series on HBO. You know her from the Dark Crystal on Netflix, Four Weddings and a Funeral on Hulu, and so much more. Miss Nathalie Emanuel, how are you today? I'm good. How are you? I'm, I'm good as good can be being in this house. Like, I'd rather be outside in the streets. How are you holding up through everything? Oh, I'm I'm doing okay. I'm I'm focusing on just everything I have to be grateful for, really, and um, mm -hmm. just keeping myself busy every day and trying to be useful where I can. And yeah, that's it, really. I think. Um, oh, trust me, I understand. 
Yeah, it's a uh, strange times we're in. Absolutely. Very, very much. So we're going to try to lighten it up. You know, everybody wants to ask all the questions about Game of Thrones, four mm -hmm. weddings and a funeral and everything. But I got a random question I want to start out with for you. Okay. Just a random one. I've heard that you're a vegan. I now, am. I, I've been vegan-ish. I'm, I'm trying to get rid of chicken and fish. I'm, I'm working on it. But I've been vegan-ish. What is like your favorite vegan recipe? Ooh. I mean, first thing I will say is that it's a journey. So, you know, the fact that you're trying is amazing. So um, okay. uh, the second thing you asked was about my favorite recipes. Um, well, I am, um, I have Caribbean heritage. So one of my favorite things to do is like um, make vegan versions of stuff and the Jamaican um, kind of national dip dish and is actually a meal that you would have for breakfast, I think, is um, ackee and saltfish. And obviously now I don't have fish, mm -hmm. so I make it without saltfish. And so um, sometimes I add like callaloo, which is like a, a dark green, like almost like a spinach in a way. Mm -hmm. And so I, um, yeah, I will do that instead. And it's delicious. And I make rice and peas and fried plantain and festivals and dumplings and all, all things. You just warmed my heart saying all of that. Like, yeah, my heart. You like I started making my own pad thai. I just like, you know what? Because I like to cook anyway. So right. I did my own pad thai. I did my own vegan lasagna. I've done so many different variations of things. I mean, mm -hmm. I even, I missed, like I can't eat red meat anymore. That's just a yeah. no-go. But, but I've started with the Impossible Burgers. And I was like, oh, okay. But I did them with a wrap instead of the bread because I'm trying to cut down my carbs. I'm just trying right. to get all healthy all the way around. Oh, that's good. That's no bad thing. Um, Not at all. Yeah, the Impossible Burger. I like it. I that's definitely something that I have occasionally. It's delicious. Good, good. So let's get right into it. I heard that you were a big fan of Game of Thrones before you even got on the show. So how did all that come about? You getting <laughs> to audition and everything? Well, I actually had a friend in the first two seasons who I'd worked with, and so. I'd um, just watched it just because everyone had been talking about the show that she was doing. And I was like, oh, let me take a look. And honestly, like the kind of fantasy genre, I and mean, while I was a fan of some fantasy stuff growing up, it wasn't like, you know, my go-to genre. So mm -hmm. I thought, you know what, I'm just going to watch and just to be supportive and just see what it's all about. And I like the first episode, I was like, wait, what? This is amazing. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, so I after kind of getting completely hooked on the show I was pretty uh kind of persistent with my agent in London being like so there's a show and I kind of want to be in it and it's not quite as simple as that they have to there has to be a role that you're right for and they have to want to bring you in to audition for it so it wasn't until I think it was like I don't even know if I don't even know if season two I think they already made season two but um, I saw a breakdown for a character <laughs> and I was like, hello to my agent. She was like, I've seen it. You've got an audition on Wednesday. <laughs> and then I did. And here we are. So, you sound like me with my agent out here. I'm, I'm like that with my agent. I see anything for a pro wrestler role because I've been a pro wrestler for 20 years. Oh, cool. I'm like, hey, so listen, <laughs> you need to go ahead and call them. So, so I can get in this door. They're like, you stop is no. calling Jay. They're like, we got a bunch of other people. I said, look, we ain't talking about them right now. But all they can say is no. <laughs> so here's my next question. Yeah. I want to, if they say no, then it just hurts. No, I mean, there's always other things. I wouldn't say it's that. You have to yeah, try. Yeah, that's true. That's you know? true. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So being Miss Sandy and on the show, we saw she went through a journey. There, there wasn't just one level to who she was. She started out as a slave who had to be diplomatic in the face of misogyny to becoming a powerful woman on her own. Can you talk about that journey? Yeah, well, uh, Masande, as you said, she was uh, stolen and enslaved at a very young age. And essentially her, her brilliance, her intelligence is what, really saved her life and was keeping her alive but she also knew that you know one wrong step one misspoken word could literally be the end so she was very good at learning she must have learned very very quickly as a matter of survival like how to be how to speak when to speak and um 
she her 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 livelihood or her well her livelihood her it was a matter of life or death for her mm. so she just had to be the best at her job and if that meant kind of like very diplomatically kind of not translating the awful things that her slave owner was saying to get the job mm. done then that's what she that's what she did but then obviously Daenerys she was <sighs> She was in on it, which was amazing. It was, <laughs> it was a great moments on the show when she let everyone know what was up. So. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? But that's one of the things I want to talk about. You were part of a show that featured so many strong women characters. Can you yeah. talk, speak to that? Yeah, I mean, it, I think what Game of Thrones um, did, which... I think, you know, at first people were like, oh, this is hard to watch. They saw so many women just getting so badly oppressed and violated and beaten and just all of these awful things. So when the rise of of the female characters in the show happened, it was so satisfying. It was Very so much. <laughs> and um yeah, and Masande is is a is another example of that. Why we didn't see her whole entire journey, you know, her her kind of journey from oppressed and enslaved to free thinking, free free feeling, you know, kind of outspoken person, you know, giving her advice even though it might not be what somebody wants to hear. Like that was a very, you know long and treacherous treacherous journey for her probably and then she was able to open herself up to love which was amazing but that was a very um slow journey but you know in the end she was as ferocious as her life had probably trained her to be as fierce and as kind of brave as um she always was and I kind of loved that that journey for her. And you just saw it for so many women in the show, you know, just overcoming so, so much pain and adversity. And then they're just, you know, killing it, which was, you know, it didn't always work out that well, but <laughs> it definitely, like, it was definitely very satisfying to watch those of my characters, like, take charge and... Oh, absolutely. But that brings me to two things. One, can you describe Masande's powerful and emotional final scene? Like, what was the energy around the entire set that day? Well, it was actually really strange because that was my last day of filming. Um, that that scene, that was my last scene that I shot on the show. Mm -hmm. And... It was really strange. We were shooting it over two days, but they started all the coverage on facing me. So I just assumed that the next day, like the likelihood of me being on camera or being even necessarily even being called in was pretty slim because these sets are so big. So they shoot all one way and then shoot the other way. And um, I was sort of filming and I was sad. I felt very sad because I was like, this is the last moment of this character that and it's like it felt like a huge responsibility for me as an actor and as someone who had been playing this character for so long and I wanted to really do it justice and do her justice and um yeah the energy was really it was it was exciting because it was like this great like there was all this the army and like the whole like seat like the set and the scene and everyone that was there it was like the energy was good and it was positive and everything but I definitely felt like there was a somberness for, for maybe just from my point of view, because I, I knew that this was like the last day for, for Miss Sunday as a living, I know she's fictional, but you know, she was still alive <laughs> for the time being. No, I exactly. Yeah. So you're, you're smiling about certain things. So that makes me ask this question. What were some of like the funniest, wildest moments that just made you all bust up laughing? Well, um, Oh gosh, there's so many over the years. Uh, it's always really fun when you've got a good number of the cast together. So lots of those kind of dining scenes, the big banquet scenes and stuff, and there's loads of us in. Like, it's you just get enough of us together and it gets very silly very quickly. 
in a in a, the most fun way. And so <laughs> it's hard to really think of a specific. Oh, but that's 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 what you want. That's what you want. Absolutely. We just had a laugh, and we've got Who such. Who would you characters. say was the biggest? Sorry. <laughs> Who would you say was the biggest joker on set? My apologies. Ooh, I, I, it, do you know what? It's a really tough one, but I'm gonna just choose one because yeah. Um, but uh, Conleth Hill, who plays um, Varys, what is mm -hmm. just probably one of the funniest humans I have ever met in my life, and he will have the whole room like laughing. He's fantastic. And um, it was very hard for me over the years because Masande is obviously quite a held, reserved individual. And mm -hmm. often Conneth is bringing out the laughs all day long. And you're like, damn it, I've got to be serious. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, love, I love him and I miss him so much. So, oh. Speaking of missing, I want to know what was the relationship like, the way you guys built the relationship with Masande and from the to the screen. Oh, sorry, you broke up a little. Okay. I'm talking about the relationship of Masande and Grey Worm. How do you take that relationship from the pages to the screen? Well, um, I guess it uh, for us it was such a slow and gradual thing. And like with each season, it's like we like each kind of step of their relationship happened in each season which was sort of wonderful. So we kind of got to grow in our friendship um, alongside getting to play those characters and building their relationship. And so it was, for us, we would just kind of sit down and have a chat about what we wanted to achieve from each scene and each moment and f from each of our own perspectives or for the characters' perspectives, like, how would they walk into this situation considering their history considering their past what is it we want to achieve and and also with the input of like the many kind of fantastic directors we've had over the years you know um it was very much a collaboration and we would try different things and by the time because what was so fantastic about game of thrones is that they were so good at giving people rehearsal and just giving like with the director and trying to figure out you know these very important moments and in a show with the scope and the number of stories and number of characters the fact that they had that attention to detail um, for us and our little piece of the story just is testament to a the success of the show and you know the performances because i think people really felt oh that was amazing yeah that they were invested in 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 us and the characters journeys too but yeah it's very much a collaboration Yeah, everyone was definitely invested in that journey. That's a for sure thing. We got a super chat question for you. It says, Mr. Emanuel, such a huge fan. How was it like jumping between the Game of Thrones and the Fast and Furious worlds in such a short time frame? Much love. Um, oh, do you know what? Funnily enough, season four, I think. You no, know, yeah, season four. I was shooting Fast and Furious 7 and season four simultaneously. And I was like, flying from Atlanta to like somewhere in Europe or to Northern Ireland. Like I'd go to Atlanta for two weeks and then I'd fly to Spain or Croatia, wherever, wherever we were. And there was definitely a moment where I was like kind of spun out just by the traveling, but also by like, who am I today? Like, this is kind of crazy. But um, the thing that I think made it easy is that the two characters have something in common is and that is that they're very kind of brilliant women and very intelligent kind of quick women and so it wasn't that hard in terms of like accessing the kind of like quickness about them or the sort of like intelligence of them I, I kind of could access that because I was sort of that lens to both characters but it was but in terms of like the experience of each of those sets like they're so different it's so um, hard to even compare the two you know like they're both epic and big and loads of people and, and like you know fire and dragons and then chases and uh, explosions it's all like they have so much in common but they're just so different and um <laughs> I, I just embrace the sort of fun of it and for me it's just like gaining experience and just I mean the fact that I'm on sets like this is something that I, you know, it's made, it's what dreams are made of for me. So I'm like,
just taking it all in and just like the enthusiasm was enough for me just to be there. <laughs> oh, I bet. I bet. We got another question that says, hi, Nat. Met you in Germany. It was awesome. Hope you like the tea. Hope your fam is all safe. Just a question. What projects do you want to work on in the future? Ooh, I mean, if you gave me tea, I'm going to assume, yes, I liked it. So thank you very much for that. Um, uh, yeah, uh, what am I looking to work on? I mean, I am always trying to expand my experiences and work with different people and on different kind of types of acting. You know, I'd love to do some theatre. I'd love to do more movies, more TV, and just see kind of what comes like what opportunities come my way because anything that will help stretch me in ex my experience as an actor um but you know i'm i'm looking to get into producing and um, i produced a short a couple of years ago that i'm trying to expand into a feature so trying my hand at that which might be fun but i'd love to do some more dramatic roles maybe some more independent film and just see and just kind of i don't like to limit myself to one specific thing but i'm kind of open to all of it at this point you shouldn't. <laughs> you shouldn't limit yourself at all. We got another question that says, so many Game of Thrones actors on Dark Crystal. If there's another season, which Game of Thrones alums would you like to see as Skeksis or Gelfings? Ooh. Um, that's a good one. Um, we've had a lot of Game of Thrones alum with uh, Dark Crystal. So I, do you know who... I have to mention is my birthday twin as well. P. Lou Ashbeck. I think he'd make a great, um, he's a vet, he's such a great kind of big character. And I think he'd make a great Skeksis, not because he's like evil or bad or anything. I think that he's just a very kind of characterful guy and has a great voice. And so I think he could bring something really fun to that. Oh, cool. So we got another one that says, spoiler alert. <laughs> What's your take on Khaleesi's arguably too quick turn to madness? My take on it, um, I mean, she lost her most BFF in the world. Uh, no, I'm joking, kind of. No, I think, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it. I think that she lost a lot of people that were very, were very dear to her in a very short amount of time. And I think um, Daenerys's kind of, violence and her, uh, her her showing that what that she has that in her I think that's kind of been fed in over the seasons we've seen her be very kind of cold and fierce and like I'm just gonna yeah do what I've got to do so she had she always had that in her in a in a, in a respect so I you know I think that while yeah, it, it it must have, it did feel like a quick turn, but I think that she, she just, it was just like the straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak, losing the Sunday. And um, yeah, so yeah. Oh, I think I've lost you. I'm gonna have a sip of tea. No, I mean, I, I, we seem to be having a few. Okay, yeah, there goes Chuck. I got you, Jay, just in case, man. I'm here. I got okay, because I, I saw it. I, I was trying to figure I was trying to keep it going, but, you know, just wanted to, I addressed it in the chat. So, yeah, I, I get that, though. I definitely do. Like, you, once you saw Cersei kill Masande, you are like, well, that's about it. She's going to turn everything down. And Masande's last word, um, being Dracarys, was like, yeah, burn it all. She weren't messing. I think I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I'd like to think that Masande, being a being a person from North, wasn't necessarily you know the uh, people uh, the people from the island of North are very peaceful creatures, very peaceful be people. They're actually vegans too. Mm. They don't eat anything. They don't eat anything that lives. They only eat from the earth. And um, little uh, background info there. Um, and so I don't know if she quite meant just like burn down an entire city, including innocent people. But she definitely was just like, oh, you better hand this bitch right now. I think she definitely meant she definitely meant that when she Oh yeah, I don't think she meant the people like the Oh no, no, no. She was like, Ugh. Yeah, definitely not the people of <laughs> Yeah, she was I think um I I was I was joking after the fact that you know Masande was in heaven, like, uh babe, that was a little not quite, <laughs> but you know. Um 
So. <laughs> So somebody asked, we have another super chat that said, did you get to puppet at all for Dark Crystal Age of Resistance? Um, I didn't, uh, not at all. I There was a wonderful, I always like to shout her out because she was amazing, Miss Becky Henderson, who um, operated and performed D, the puppet and um, basically established her character and her performance really through the through the puppet and through her own voice acting and then um and then I was in the studio once it was all kind of cut together and then I had to revoice and put my own performance onto the character so we like to say that we're Deet's mothers because Deet has two fathers in Game of Thrones um, in, Game, in Dark Crystal mm -hmm. uh, confused. in Dark Crystal she she has two fathers and so we like to say that we're her two mothers so Oh, yeah. so beautiful. Uh, it's very sweet. So someone has a question. Damnation Magazine has a question for you. And I had a lot of people actually ask me to ask you this question. Would you ever consider a role in the MCU? Um, yeah. <laughs> Who does? I mean, I'd lo I've always said that I want to play a superhero at some point. Just once. Just one time. I'll, I'll be a very happy lady if I get to do that once. Um, yeah, I'd love to do that. Yeah. Like I said, I'm I'm i at this point I would consider anything. Do you have a particular one? Oh, uh I don't know. I'm I'll be honest, I'm not particularly like clued up on all the characters. I'm not sorry. But um I would uh yeah, I'd love to play someone with a cool power, like I don't know, mind control or something. <laughs> hmm. I could see you as the female Iron Iron Man. Her name is Ironheart. She plays the character named oh. Williams. Oh, yes. I think you'd be perfect her. for that. Sometimes people fan cast me as her, and I've seen her, and she's got a she's got an awesome fro as well. I mean, sure, why not? <laughs> although my opinion is, I, although I'm not sure that. I'm <laughs> a bit, I'm uh, but we have a cowboy. Oh, but we got a question that says, please make Age of Resistance season two. Oh, uh, well, you know, if I only had the power to, you know, make that happen, I I, I have no idea what what happens next with that. But um, I hope that they do another another one, too, because that was a lot of fun. Well, this is going to be the last one I think we're going to be able to take today. And they say if you did basically play a comic book character, would you be a superhero or supervillain? It's always fun to be the hero because everyone likes you, but I would probably like the challenge of being a villain. You just won my heart. You just won my heart. I am all about the villain. I mean, yeah, because it's like, I haven't really done that yet. So it's something I haven't tried before. So that would be a really fun challenge. Cool, cool. So before we let you get up out of here, if the people want to find you on social media and show their love, tell them how they can reach you. Oh, yes. I am on Instagram and my handle is at Natalie Emmanuel, spelled N-A-T-H-A-L-I-E-E-M-M-A-N-U-E-L. -E 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 and then on Twitter, I am at Miss N Emmanuel. That's me. All right. Thank you so much to Miss Natalie Emanuel. Please stay safe, you too. sane Thank throughout you this much. entire craziness. Hope you stay well. I will. Ladies and gentlemen, please stay tuned. We got a lot more coming up next. And to hear it right now, take a word from our sponsors. This is Batman. I want to be sure you know about Mainframe Comic Con. It'll be online the 25th and the 26th, and all the proceeds are going to the Red Cross and the Hero Initiative. So be sure to check it out. There are a lot of bad people in the world. And Charlie Manx is one of them. I'll admit I underestimated you. I will stop you even if it kills you, Mr. Palmas. Think of me at Christmas time, won't you?
Hey guys, welcome back to our Chicago broadcast here of Mainframe Comic Con, broadcasting from Chicago Comics in the heart of the Windy City, 3244 North Clark Street, just under the shadow of Wrigley Field. We hope you guys are enjoying all the fun here at Mainframe Comic Con. If you have a question for our next guests, leave them in the comment section. We'll try to uh, get those asked at the end of the interview. So let's keep this Mainframe thing rolling right along. Very excited to announce our next guest. There's one of them. Uh, you know them from the critically acclaimed sketch comedy show, The Kids in the Hall. Actors and comedians Scott Thompson and Bruce McCullough. This is a real honor. Thanks for coming to Mainframe. We're right, happy. Thanks. We're happy to be here. Scott Scott Thompson looks crazy. I think he got a facelift overnight. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just tape. Oh, okay, good. Tape. Good. Bruce, uh, we'll get into this, but are those show notes I see in the background over there? Oh no, 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 <laughs> not at all, not at all. No, 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 no. That that is that's. I'm in my actual office, my home office, um, and those are cards from the upcoming series of Kids in the Hall. Some things we wrote, some things just didn't make it, did they, Scott? No, they didn't. That's why I look crazy and I had a facelift. <laughs> yeah, he, he takes rejection very badly, young Scott Thompson. Well, speaking of hanging out in one's home office, how are you guys handling uh, your current social isolation? You guys are uh, coming to us from Toronto, Canada, I believe. Yes, How's things going up there? Um, Scott's going crazy. Scott got two cats. Um, I haven't and... got the cats yet, though, so I'm a little crazy. I've started to pet an old sweater that I left in the middle of the living room. And I keep coming in and going, hey, how you doing, buddy? And I keep petting it because it's the color of my cats that are coming. No. So, but it started talking back last night. So once you they do the home visit, Scott, they will not give you those cats. <laughs> That's a good uh, thing about COVID. They're not doing any home visits. So yeah. they have no idea. They're just giving them to me. Yeah. They trust us now. Well, I mean, let's go ahead and jump right into it, guys. Kids in the Hall, I mean, yeah. personally, huge, huge fan. I've been watching your show uh, since I was a child, been watching it all through. I've seen the live stage show, loved the movie. Uh, I wonder if we can kind of wind the clock back uh, just just a couple years to yeah. the beginning of Kids in the Hall. Let's take a little uh, trip down memory lane. Uh, can you kind of explain to our audience sort of uh, how the five of you guys got together, uh, your introduction to Lauren Michaels, pretty much the entire history of the early years of Kids in the Hall? Shouldn't I just go, these are the days I know, I know. Um, no, uh, Mark and I originated in, out of Calgary. We went to something called Loose Moose Theatre, which was uh, theater sports, which was improvised comedy. And we just started saying, hey, can we write some scenes after? And we wrote the Daves I Know and, you know, Farmers on Heroin and all our crazy sketches. And we got successful re re relatively quickly. Um, and then I said, we have to move to Toronto. Calgary successful. Yeah, Calgary cool. successful. There was there was there was nine people in the audience, yeah. three of them with cowboy boots. Yeah. And um, no, we came to Toronto, and then we had made a friendship with Dave and Kevin, and started working with them. And then, and then the gay blade came in near the end and gave us um, <laughs> our performance power in Scott Thompson. And so we just, you know, it it sounds like it happened fast, but it it seemed like it took forever in our minds. Yeah. I think I thought so. Yeah. And um, we had been scouted by Saturday Night Live and Mark and I ended up going as writers. And <clears throat> we sort of became friends with Lauren because we were Canadians and he'd walk by our office and go, you know, Canadians are really nice. Oh, you know. Um, and he said, do you want to come out to Amagansen sometime? And I said, why? Is it a work thing? He said, no, it's a social thing. I said, oh, no, I don't think I need to go. Um, but he uh, he be he became friends with us and he came and saw the sh saw the troupe and said, hey, Let's do a show. And many years later, we got on the air. <laughs> yeah. Is that pretty much right, Scott? Did he, did he, did he skip right. anything? Pretty much right, yeah. yeah. It's pretty close. And then Lauren brought us down to New York, and he wanted to test us in like uh, 87, 88. And, at the, and he said, I got it. You're big in Toronto, and, and but that's like, you know, nothing compared to New York. He wanted to see if we would if we could make it in New York. So he brought us down to New York. He put us up in really crappy apartments. He gave us an allowance. Yeah. And he had us open for who, everybody. He just said, you're going to do it. You know, you're going to open for all these people. You're going to learn. I'm going to give you an allowance. And at the end of six months, if you have an audience, then we'll really see about getting you a show. And it, it worked. We got a Rolling Stone story. And that that was it. And in Canada, if you get, you have to be successful in the States before they take you seriously here. So that worked really? out. Well, uh, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the show, guys. Since it's just the two of us, I feel like we can be honest with one another. We can yeah. let, it, let all the truth fly. Uh, but out of all the five cast members, who do you think plays 
uh, the sexiest, most attractive female. And can you point to a specific character uh, who you think really crushed the 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 other gender more than anybody else? May I say something here about this? I yeah. find, I've always found this very interesting. That men, men always say this. They always go, who's the best looking woman? As if the best looking woman is the most realistic woman. And I, I think that's, I, I would say Dave was the most beautiful woman that, you know, because of an accident of genetics, et cetera, and the shape of his face and all the rest of it. But, and I guess, and I also probably the most, most realistic too. So I guess he wins both. And it would, be, it would be Jocelyn, the uh, French-Canadian hooker. <laughs> right. like the most beautiful woman in the show. Not played Do you her. agree? Well, um, I guess. It's always such a weird question. I mean, of course, yeah. I, think, I think I'm the cutest woman. But because um, I, I, I have those nice little feet and I've got my little runner's legs. Especially um, in the movie. It's yeah. you're, just, you're just so adorable <laughs> in, the, in, in, in Brain Candy. Um, but it is funny. I, you know, I took to the drag slowly because I'd always, we'd always get asked interviews about it. Tell me about the drag. And it was like, yeah. it wasn't a big thing to me. Like it never, it didn't feel anything different than just putting on a suit jacket, which is just as foreign as yeah. putting. So um, I don't know. I, I, I think though we became alive when we started playing women. You know, because I think when we started, we didn't really play women. And then once we started playing women, I think there's the, the troop, the energy of the troop really came alive. Because it became a real adventure to like dive really deep into it. Because we didn't even really think of it as drag. We never called it drag. You're just playing a male character or a female character. And that was it. So it wasn't like they were trying to be glamorous or gorgeous. If they were gorgeous, then you had to try, like Dave with Jocelyn. But like when I play Fran, my mother character, she's certainly not gorgeous or glamorous, but she's certainly a woman. And well, it was a, a real adventure. I mean, a real adventure, actually. Well, you talk about yeah, coming up with uh, uh, new characters and stuff. Can you tell us a little bit about the sort of the creative process uh, with with the whole troupe? I mean, you guys all come up with your own uh, uh, characters and, and skits, or is it is it a really group effort we don't know um yeah, quite honestly like it's funny that kevin mcdonald tours around america and canada uh teaching <laughs> workshop on comedy writing i don't know how to do it um it is really it's really chaos theory like someone will have an idea someone else will have an idea we write together we write individually um we fight about ideas someone will take somebody else's idea and say oh, i'm writing that up hey you can't write that up that's my idea yeah. um and what was interesting for this uh, Amazon show is that we uh, we spend a lot of time together in a room, like just just blue skying, as they call it. Just like you, you got anything? Yeah. How about a hostage taking situation? OK. And like just going. I said to Mark, hey, how about something on the wonderful world of recycling? And then he he just snaps to. And now we have a recycle, a crazy recycling scene. Um, and I think. Our show, this the new series, is going to be really good for that reason. That before COVID, you know, got us working virtually, we spent weeks together around a table in the way we really probably hadn't, right, Scott? And I no, think, it, and it really helped us face each other, laugh at each other's ideas, and you know, like when the Pixies go on the road, they got they got to play with each other, and that's what we did. I think we were a little more generous with each other than we were when we were younger. And I think that's a good thing because, as Bruce said earlier, like this is something that happened in this one that never really happened before. Someone would have an idea and they didn't really have the energy or the how to write it and someone else would take it and write it. And that didn't really happen before. Like like Squee, this piece that I wrote. It didn't get in, but I'm still going to keep pushing. But <laughs> it was still get in. Yeah about pigs looking forward to being slaughtered. But <laughs> I loved it because I knew how to write it. And, uh, but that that sort of thing didn't really happen before. I remember when Bruce, remember Bruce, when you tried to write the Buddy Cole monologue? Right. I was having none of it years ago. Yeah, once I, once I wrote him a monologue and he said, I'm not doing it, but I'll strip it for jokes. I did. <laughs> I mean, I still might do that today, but I would be much more open to thinking, geez, someone else might have a good idea too. Right. Um, so that that was really exciting, and we were and we were very lucky that we had all those weeks before the world fell apart, before they pushed us into solitary confinement, and that was a real gift to us. It right. looks like Bruce is still working back there. He's, oh, he's I'm working. He's got a lot of notes on his oh, wall. <laughs> uh, we're still working. I'm not. Stopping. I thought you were talking about he kept changing his dick. Yeah. yeah, opening it and then closing yeah. it. And going speaking of, speaking of Buddy Cole, are we going to see any uh, Buddy Cole in the upcoming Amazon? I know you guys can't say much about it. 
yeah, they're yeah, we be can't shut Buddy Cole up. The funny thing about whenever we work with Scott, be it on tour, be it anything, he goes, I'm not doing Buddy Cole. And we say, oh, okay, fine. We don't need Buddy Cole. No, I'm serious. I am not doing Buddy Cole. And this will go on and on and on. And then he'll, then he'll finally go, okay, I'll do Buddy Cole. The show <laughs> needs him. And it's like, oh, Scott, we don't really want you to do Buddy Cole. And it's just I, a fun game to play with Scott for 30 years. And we played it all through this one, too. So, yes, <laughs> making an appearance, even after me making a speech about, you know what? I think we've gone past Buddy Cole. I know I have 11 monologues, but I don't need to put them in. And then cut to, I think we need a bit more Buddy. So yeah. you open open your luggage and there's an ascot and just ready to yeah. go just in case you need it. Yeah. No, he's uh, definitely he's definitely making an appearance. Yeah. And I and I will say for anyone and hope uh, who have seen Scott's one man show with the Buddy Cole, it is brilliant. I mean, for me, that was one of the reasons I really wanted to get back on the air. Like he is saying stuff that is so so smart, so weird, so wild, so edgy, and for you know, I don't know if he's going to tour with it again. Maybe oh, no. people won't tour for a while, but it is. It is brilliant. And so you'll see some flashes of that in this sh- in this series. Yeah. Very, very excited for that, guys. I want to talk a little bit about Brain Candy. I mean, we're kind of moving yeah. in a uh, timeline sort of way here yeah. in the interview. Um, uh, 1996, guys, if you haven't seen it, Kids in the Hall, they made the jump from television to the big screen with the movie Kids in the Hall, Brain Candy. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, sort of the decision to make the jump from the small screen to the big screen? You know, how did it, how, how, where'd that idea come from? Was it you guys? Was it just the natural progression at that time, because a lot of Saturday Night Live movies were getting made out of Saturday Night Live sketches. Obviously, you guys are not Saturday Night Live, but no, what, we're not. Yeah, what made the what made the jump from uh, from small screen to big screen? Well, I think it was just um, something we were told we should do. I mean, I f- I think we thought then that you graduated from your TV show and then you did a series of movies. Yeah. Unfortunately for us, the movie that we had to do was Brain Candy, mm-hmm. and. Um, you know, it's only like we've done some readings of it and stuff. Now, I think it's only when we went through this uh, look back on this dark period in our professional and personal lives um, that we've been able to move forward because it really was our darkest days. Yeah. It was, you know, there were some personal problems in the troupe and people's families and things like that. And just the process of making it was so horrendous. I remember looking at a call sheet and it said all all calls add six and a half hours because it just took so yeah. much work and it was so you know so so there was some pain that you can actually feel i think in the movie if you yeah. want you know it was uh it was a nightmare <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, it. just look at the the list of characters in your imdb i mean bruce you alone you played uh alice uh cisco grievo w- w- worm pill scientist cop number two cancer boy white trash man i mean you guys did how many characters in, in that movie? Forty something. Yeah, it was it was too many. And you know, the great Lauren Michaels has a great line, which is how 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 will we miss you if you don't go away? Meaning that performers should get off screen for a minute. And I think if I had Brain Candy to do again, I would cast some of those roles with other other performers. Which I think what Bruce is trying to say is, if he would had to do it over again, he'd cast those roles with me. I, yes. I think. Yeah, of course. Well, Scott, you your that. list, your list is insane. I mean, you, there were times in that movie where you're playing Mrs. Hurdicker and a scientist, like in the same scene. I know. Uh, it's- what What was Dave doing while you were over here filling all the scr- all the spots? I never spoke to Dave once during the that movie, so I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, I only spoke to him when we were shooting. That's the truth. So that with the movie so was so, so back then. So many characters. Uh, I mean, can you can both of you guys point to a character you liked uh, a, a playing the most in Brain Candy, and B you were most happy with the way that it it, it came out on screen? Well, I I mean, I have to say, Cancer Boy, because oh, yeah. it, you know, it is it is the beauty of our stupidity, like and and the fact that we didn't cut uh, Cancer Boy out of the movie, which was you know, it took a hit. Like they they pulled the advertising when we wouldn't take Cancer Boy out of the movie yeah. or minimized it. And so it was, you know, win, win the, the battle, not the war. Um, but I still think that that sweet little soul of that little guy, w- there's just something about him that I love so much. Um, and so I'd have to say Cancer Boy. Scott. Yeah, I agree. I think you're right. I think it was Cancer Boy. And I, I can't believe people still to this day think Bruce played Cancer Boy. It's, it's unbelievable to me. You know, I let it go. <laughs> You know what? I've gotten gracious. I think that's the only word for me. Yeah. Well, I mean, another character, and then this one always kind of fascinates me. Um, you know, in 1997, Mike Myers famously uh, parodied Lorne Michaels as Dr. Evil and Austin Powers, but you guys did it first when uh, Mark McKinney uh, played uh, uh, 
Don. Don Gerard Torres. Yes. Did did Lauren know that was coming, or did it take him by surprise? Was his his idea? Did he have to give you the green light, or did he even realize you guys were? It was an obvious Lauren Michael parody. He well, I remember we went to the first. We had the first screening at Paramount. Um, and we didn't tell him, and I guess his people should have told him. Um, he came, he, and he was white. He was, and he came from the screen. We walked from the screening together to his bungalow, and he said, um, "I guess I should be uh, flattered." And I said, <laughs> "I said, yeah, we we all love you. It's it's such a loving portrayal." And he went, and I saw him kind of make the decision. Okay, that's cool, because he's he's a, such a smart guy. He knows that. He should be fought or two. And there is no there's no one more interesting as an enigmatic, sort of laconic power monger than the great Lord Michaels, for sure. So he so but he didn't know it was coming. And we're all Canadian, so we can do it. I think that's why he let Mike and us take the piss out of him. Right. <laughs> you get to pat well, I mean, I want to talk about the live stage show. We were lucky enough uh to See, I believe it was the uh, Rusty and Ready tour when you guys you came to the Chicago Theater. Yeah. It was absolutely amazing. You, you came out in the white wedding dresses right at the bat. I mean, you did some of my favorite uh, sketches live on on show on stage. I mean, at what point after the movie, after the series, did you guys say, you know what, let's take this thing on the road and uh, see if it works? And how's it different than you know your experiences on set? Well, I think it was five years before we toured. After the after brain candy, we didn't speak to each other for years. Actually, each person went into their own little orbit, and then sort of realized that we're better together. And then we slowly came back together again. And I guess five years after we put everything to bed, we started touring again, and, and it was fun. Well, and I think that is the thing. I think once we realized it was the first time we went out was in two thousand, and somebody said, "You're selling tickets faster than Sting." It's like, oh great. Um, great, I have to do more shows. And that's how it was at that time, but it was so fun. And I think, you know, we had lots of fun doing the show and we have fun together, but mostly it's hard. And I think the live shows have always been fun. It's always been fun to be drunk on the bus with my brothers going from Portland to Seattle and, you know, playing for people. And because we never really got to enjoy ourselves when we were doing the show, you know, we, the, the, the TV show, it was just such a grind. Uh, I remember when I was to bed every night with my ears ringing because I was so exhausted. But the tour was was so much fun that we we wanted to keep doing it. And then yep. the touring and performing like that, you don't have to write. You just have to perform. And that's that's such a that's the that's a beauty because writing is such a burden. And I mean, I love it, but it is a burden, and it, it, it haunts you until you get it right. But once you're ready to perform, it's just a it's a dream. Bruce, we got a hilarious question here in the comment section. Yeah. I wanted to ask you from BA in the house. He writes, Bruce, if there was a pill that gave worms to ex-girlfriends, would you use it? <laughs> <I'm gay. laughs> okay. Well, I would I would need hundreds, to be quite frank. <laughs> okay. No, that would be cruel. That would be misogynist. I could be horrible. That. that that was just a character I was playing. That's a terrorist act. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about the Amazon show. Guys, it's coming back after so many years on uh, Amazon Prime Video. It is the first ever uh, Amazon original series, uh, Canadian Amazon original series. You guys proud of that? Is that something that you're like, wow, we're the first? Yeah, very proud. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, you know, we feel like we're we're Canadian. And it's, so it's, you know, and it, when we were starting to talk about what we would do for a show, like, oh, we're not at the CBC? Oh, that's weird. But uh, Amazon seemed like such a great place that, it, it felt like really the right thing to do. And they didn't say they were going to change all the references, which was always a struggle before. They were like, yeah, you're Canadian. You know, you're, that's, you don't have to change things to make it American. And that's, a, that's amazing because that's always been a struggle. Well, Americans can't relate to it if it's Canadian. I think that people are past that now, and I'm really glad of that. And Amazon has not made – they've not said anything about that. So they go, you, you, be who you are, and part of who you are – is sadly Canadian. No, they've embraced that. I mean, I think that's that's part of their spoken yeah. mandate. Well, finally, a country. We're like, oh, you're like British. Yeah. You know, if you're British or German or whatever, they just say, Be, do who you are. So we are who we are. We you tried guys, our damnedest to kill it, but we can't. You guys are a beacon of hope for everybody down here right now, I got to say. Uh, so, I mean, how much, percentage-wise, how many uh, new sketches are we looking at versus how many uh, sort of recurring? I know you can't talk about a lot. Right. I wanna, we don't want to pry. But is it? No, I'll, I'll read you some stuff. Just kidding. Um, it. No, we're the doing, board. We're doing. Uh, we're doing a lot of new material. Like uh, we're doing some of our. We'll do, probably do wedding dresses from our stage show, or some of our favorite things. But we're writing new, new weird things, and 
we've always responded to the world we're in and now we're weird older men in this murky world. So that's what our material is. But yeah, we'll, people's favorite characters will, will be there um, in new situations. And you'll see old characters kind of dealing with the, the modern world a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then there's just brand new stuff that just, you know, we thought was funny and we wrote. And again, we were so lucky because we had half of the time before COVID and then the other half after COVID. So we're so lucky that we get to write about the two worlds. And um, it's just, it's all new, basically. There's stuff from the tour and stuff from a couple of monologues from my show, but it's new, new, new. And um, it's exciting to also take characters that have aged and going, what are they doing now? The, right. the, kid, the kid in the chair, the, the painting of the chair. And oh, uh, Kevin, he's, if he's all grown up. We can't, <laughs> no, he'd still be a kid. We, we've talked about this. <laughs> and like, the Kathy's have aged. You know, yeah. Brad and Gordon have aged. Like I think two characters don't age. Buddy and Gavin haven't changed. Yeah. They're exactly the same yeah. age as they always were. There we Brad go. Diaz. We wish we thing were thing. Canadian. <laughs> so, I mean, obviously, uh, there's no, there's been no release date set for the show, as far as I'm aware. Was a relaunch of the show something that you guys always kind of had in the back of your mind, or was it something that you just kind of decided to do recently? Oh, no, it's just been in the back of well, our collective mind for quite a few years, I think. Yeah, and I think, to be frank, Scott has been beating the drum the hardest. He would take me out for lunch every six months, come yes, 40 minutes yes. late, and then plead that we should do the show. Um, I, You know, we're so weird as a group. Like, we don't make any sense, the kids in the hall. No. And I think we all wanted to do it. We just never got around to it. And then somebody was busy, and then somebody else was busy. And it sort of became like, okay, if we don't do it now, we're never going to do it. Yeah. And I think we've just we've loved each other so much over the last few years that it felt like let's do this again. Cause we still have stuff to say, you know? Yeah. Cause I, I don't know. Like for me, I just, it's the place where I'm most myself. It's where I get to do what I do. And I think all of us are like that. And so it, I've wanted to do this for quite a few years and I'm very, cause I want to see, I want to comment. We want to comment on the world as we, as we go through it. It's like, you know, that thing seven up where they, they go yeah. back to those kids every seven years. We're kind of like that. We're like the seven up gang. We're now the, you know, 59 up gang, you yeah. know? Well, I also, I remember when I went to see Mavis Staples one night and she was 75 at the time and she was so amazing. And I remember at the end of the show, she said, uh, I've got CDs for sale in the lobby. Yeah. And I, for some reason that I said, okay, I'm a blues musician. I got to keep doing this. And that's why I even do my own shows. I don't care if there's 200 people or 2000 people there. I'm a, a, you know, we're kind of blues musicians. We got to keep doing it. And I think that's, that's what I got to. Yeah. I would say I, mine was my, my experience with that was BB uh, King in the seventies. Look at that fucking man. It's unbelievable. <laughs> and so yeah. that's who we are. Yeah. You know, BB King and Mavis Staples. That's, that's, <laughs> I mean, it's been pretty obvious for years, but I think we are black icons. It's so clear. Pretty much. <laughs> black blues was <laughs> <laughs> got a question from a DJ Stang GFX in the comment section. He said, question, did you guys think back to Shakespearean times where the man portrayed women for inspiration? Um, well, it, it would be Scott, if anybody. I would answer to that. I would say <laughs> maybe no. <But> also, <laughs> at the same time, the, the reason that we played women is very much the same reason they played women back then. Because back then, they had no women. Women weren't allowed to be actors. They were basically an actor was a whore, right? And you could be both. And so you cut to us many, many years later and we didn't have any women. So it was necessity. Yeah. We were such losers that we could attract no women um, at all to work with us. And this is how bad they were as men. I'm the gay guy. I got way more women than they did. This is how <laughs> yeah. unheterosexual a group this is. <laughs> a little question, a question from Andy King. He said, hi, Andy. He said, hi, Andy. I'm Andy too. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Wrong one. Well, he's at the bong. <laughs> well, you know, it's COVID time. It's the, it's the, the cocaine and the bong. Oh, Andy, really you could have said Randy. I mean, come <laughs> on, Andy. You got to read between the lines. He's a Z is me says, will there be more shadowy men music? There will be more shadowy men music. Yes. That's And that's almost the first question we asked ourselves um, and people ask us because really? they have always made us hip. We've never really been hip. We've never really been cool, but the shadowy men are fucking cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, we're going to stay with that. Yeah. So, guys, anything else you can tell us uh, without uh, breaking any sort of contracts about uh, what people can expect from the new show? 
Anything well, just, you guys work out? Let's read some let's, stuff. Let's, let's I got a, a script. Look. Got a let's script take a look right at here. the wall real wow. quick. You know, <laughs> this might not be let's take a tour of Bruce's the office. excitement as when we were young, but there will be nudity. Uh, male, older, male nudity. I hope Thank there's you, no Amazon. There's no nudity. I I just want to show this picture. Uh, I hope there's not too much glare on it. Oh, I'm gonna get one. You do that. I get. I got one to show. Yeah, you. it is. It is the inspiration of my life, and most of the Amazon series will be about this picture. And the, it is. It is a picture I found on the street 25 years ago, and it is my most prized possession. I love that picture. Half of the show will be inspired by that, and the other half will be inspired by this beauty. <laughs> Bruce, do you remember this? Oh yes, very well, very Bruce. well. Tell the little story about that. You found it, didn't you? Yeah, I found it in the street. That's yeah. where all my all my stuff comes from. And I, I still have it, and it's now in my office, and it's going to be my new avatar. There you go. There you go. So that's what our show is going to be about. Are you pleased that I have that still, Bruce? Oh, yeah, I am. I And then the other part will be uh, Ted Kennedy doll, <laughs> Teddy Bear, who, which is uh, – so that's what the Amazon series is going to be all about. And – this will be the credits. This will be the credits will be here. And, and then, much. of course, the closing of the show is my my David Bowie quote. Yeah. I know when to go out. I know when to stay in. And then, of course, we're David like, David you know, we're the good guy. But, you know, <laughs> we're also the bad guy. <laughs> yeah, good bit, Scott. Good bit. There good bit. Go. All right, I want to ask you if this means anything to you in the comment section from Catherine Cox says, Hey, Bruce, this is Jane's mom. She certainly was attracted by you guys. Do we know who Jane is and who her mom is? No, but I see a picture of her mom. She's not bad either. Not bad. Yeah. That looks like. Yeah. Oh, I don't know to say anything. I'm just going to put the ram's head back up. Yeah, he needs the ram's head. Put my crotch right here. There you go. There you go. Oh, there we go. Uh, professionally later. I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have ripped it off the wall. Didn't even Big, bo Big Boss writes, this is going off the rails, and I love it. <laughs> yeah, this is what our pitch comment. sections have been. Scott doing, like, bits while we're actually spilling coffee on his computer and doing bits while we're trying to write. You can't do comedy this yeah. way. Yeah. Well, guys, I wish we could do this all day long. we got to wrap it up. We're going to move on to our next guest, which are the, the, the cast from the movie Clerks. Thank you so much, Bruce and Scott, for coming to Mainframe Comic Con, donating your time generously. Um, anything you'd like to tell the audience out there before we uh, let you go? No, just that we love you. Yeah. Stay, stay sane. Stay we'll safe. All, we'll all get through this. <laughs> Well, guys, look for uh, season six of uh, Kids in the Hall on Amazon Excellent. Prime Video coming at some point. So stick around, guys. We're going to take the shortest of breaks. We're going to continue broadcasting live here from Chicago Comics on Mainframe Comic Con. And uh, stick around. Up next, Brian O'Halloran and Marilyn Gigliotti from the movie Clerks. Stick around. Thanks, Bruce and Scott. See you later. See you guys after this short break. Thank you. There are a lot of bad people in the world. And Charlie Manx is one of them. I'll admit I underestimated you. I will stop you even if it kills you. That's a promise. <laughs> Think of me at Christmas time, won't you? Hey, we are back, guys. That was tons of fun with the cast of Kids in the Hall, but none more fun than our next guest, guys. Joining us here from uh, parts all over the world here at Mainframe Comic Con, you know them as, uh, I mean, from the movie Clerks, 1994 there, both accomplished actors, producers, and directors. Welcome, please, Brian O'Halloran and, and, and Mary Gigliotti. Ooh, we got Ooh, an echo. echo. Hello, hello. Sorry, sorry. That's probably me. Oh, I like, I like it. it. It's, it's awesome. Let's awesome. harmonize. <laughs> okay. Okay. No, no, it's still, still kind of kind of angry. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, okay. 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 That's, That's kind of weird because, because I've never, I've never had, had a problem, problem before. before. This is, this is nuts. nuts. Is your computer, computer on? on? It's on, on mute. Weird. Brian, Brian how, how you doing? Right there? I'm doing good. Thank you for asking. Thanks for having us. Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. absolutely. So, so how, how everybody? everybody? <laughs> <laughs> How's everybody, How's everybody uh, uh, handling quarantine? Uh, good. 
you know, uh, I'm about two and a half hours northwest of New York City, so uh, population is thinner up here. So uh, stores are better stocked and things like that. Uh, I've been very fortunate enough that uh, we have enough food, toilet paper, and pet supplies for me and my girlfriend, Diana. So, so far, so good. And my family is spread across the United States are all well as well. Are we taking, are we taking any hobbies? hobbies? Uh, any hobbies? No, but I am, uh, I've been uh, rehearsing the past two weeks for a, uh, a live stream uh, play reading uh, of I Hate Hamlet, which will be on Facebook tomorrow night. I'll be sending out uh, information tonight about that. Marilyn, how are you doing? What's going on? You all right there? Can you hear us, Marilyn? Marilyn? It's funny because I think we can hear her tapping on her keyboard. Sorry. Sorry. Can you hear can me? You hear me? I can hear you. Okay. okay. I can hear, can hear you. you. I don't, I hear, don't an hear an echo, echo anymore. anymore. Well, that's good. <laughs> but we hear you. Okay. I, I, don't, I don't know what's, what's going, going on because, because I've, I've never, never had. You, you, I've, 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 done, I've, I've done, done the same, same setup, setup that I've always, always done, done with this. But how am I doing in quarantine? Not gonna lie. I'm starting to kind of get bored, especially since I'm by myself. I don't, I don't have, have anybody, anybody else quarantined, quarantined with, with. And, and uh, the, uh, the first, first three weeks, weeks loved, loved it. Completely, completely loved, loved it. it. Uh, but, but now, now I'm just kind of, uh, we got to get I'm ready, I'm ready for, for it to end, end but, but uh, uh, you, know, you know, we'll see, we'll see how, how, how long, long it goes. goes. Marilyn. Marilyn. Oh, oh, yes, yes. Would you Would mind jumping, jumping out, out and then coming back in? Yeah, got it. All right, all right, thanks. Well, so Brian, Brian, what about, who, who? She's still in. still in. There we go. There we go. Much better. Is that me? Is that me? Am I muted? Am I muted? Out? out? Sorry, Sorry, guys. That's all right. Hey, Chad. Hey, Chad. Jump in. Jump in. I'm back. I'm back. <laughs> so, so, hey. hey. Man, I'm, man, getting, I'm getting back. back. Are you getting, getting feedback, feedback from me, from me now, too? now, too? Is it coming from me? Because I have headphones on, so I don't know how that would happen. Okay, okay, we're good, good. No, shit, shit. Hey, Brian, do you have, um, uh, it, your, your speakers, speakers on? on? Who, me? Yeah, yeah. No, I have headsets. Okay, okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try, try something. something. Give me one Give me second, one second. Okay. okay. Sure. So, guys, we told you from the get-go that we were going to have uh, some technical difficulty, and I think we got that. So, Mar Marilyn, can you can I hear you? Yes. Can you hear me? Sounds good. Chuck, are you good? I'm on. All I'm right. Good. So, I'm going to ask Brian to leave and come back in as well because I think because it's, it's coming from his coming from his speakers. Are you sure? Let me try it again. Let yeah. Again. Yeah. Okay. Check. Okay. We're all good. Marilyn, how are you doing? Hot. You got your reboot <laughs> road show on, huh? Oh my god, it is so hot here in California. I mean, I don't mind, you know, warm weather, but from 60 all the way to over 90s pretty much overnight and and unfortunately, I can't even have the fan on otherwise <laughs> you'll hear that little ooh in the background. <laughs> Well, you got a nice glow about you. Um, uh, thank you. <laughs> I want to talk about some of your recent projects as uh, we get Brian back on. You, know, you recently were in the the suspense, which is like a revival of this classic 1940s, 1950s television, television. radio anthology series. Yeah. So um, uh, John Alcidek, uh, uh has had this, this going on, on for a few years. years. Ooh, ooh, now, now, now we're again. Again. Yeah, no, um, Hang on. That must be me then. <laughs> go ahead. So... Um, so yeah, he he does like kind of this Alfred Hitchcocky type of of uh, radio show, and so I've done quite a few in the past few years. Um, it's very fun to do, just to go into the booth and collaborate with others. And uh, you know, even though he's there to direct us, and, and he does, it's like we always kind of redirect ourselves as well because we kind of know it's like, whoop, let me do that again. <laughs> so I see you're rocking your Jay and Silent Bob a uh, reboot road show. Sure. Yeah. Did you happen to get a chance to go out on the road with uh, um, Kevin and Jay? No, that would have been amazing. I did go out uh, here in LA uh, to the show to see it with all the other fans, and uh, it was it was a great experience. 
It was. We were able to check it out uh, when they came to the Music Box Theater here in Chicago and the fans just went nuts. What was the general reaction uh, when you went and saw it? Just... You know, um, and it's not even with just ours. It's like as soon as they recognize anyone from the View Askew universe, there was just roars. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, um, oh, I think Brian's about to hop back on. Do you still have an issue with me? Here? You are good, awesome. my friend. Good. You are golden. Okay. Brian, I want to talk to you a little bit. We're just kind of talking about uh, current projects and uh, more recent stuff. I recently just saw you in uh, Jason Muse's uh, directorial debut film of Madness and the Method. Yes. What was, a shockingly uh, awesome film that was. <laughs> it's funny how you say shockingly awesome. I mean, awesome. <laughs> it was different than what, you know, when I, when I saw the trailer, I was kind of thinking it'd be one thing. And then I saw it and I was like, wow, this is totally different than what I thought it was going to be. We were got, got a chance to see it in theaters. Tell us a little bit about uh, working with Jay as a director. You know, I've, I've known Jay now... Uh... 26 years and to see the growth of where I knew him from to uh, to grow with uh, Madness and the Method. That's the film right there. Now available also on Amazon and also on uh, iTunes and other streaming networks. He was great to work with. You know, um, he had a really great team around him. Uh, we shot a majority of the film in uh, Derby in England. Uh, that's where his uh, writer and producer were based out of. Uh, and then they did the L.A. stuff in L.A. Um, and it was over uh, like a, a couple of month period of time. And uh, working with him as a director was awesome. He knows what he wants. Um, and he says it in the way that you know Jay to how to, to explain things. But he was really great to work with. And uh, he put me in a role that was kind of antithetical to who I am as a person, which was fun to play. Um, so working with him and working with this crew in England, and it was a lot of fun. I mean, you had people like Danny Trejo in it and Vinnie Jones and so many great people. Obviously, Kevin uh, makes an appearance in it as well. And it's uh, a really cool alternate universe of Hollywood uh, that uh, I think people will enjoy. It's awesome, guys. If you guys have a chance to check it out, I think you can find it um, streaming on Amazon and it might, might even be on Netflix right now. Uh, like I said, we had a chance to go see it in theaters here in Chicago, and I was blown away by it. It was phenomenal. Especially yeah, you. You actually play yourself Thank uh, you. as an sort actor of. in Hollywood. <laughs> sort of. Not really. Oh, hold on. Marilyn? Let's, yeah. let's compare and contrast uh, real-life Brian versus real-life film Brian. Oh, my gosh. I don't know. Uh... And it, it was a fine line. It really was. It was a very fine line. But but what was disturbing for me though is spoiler, um, huh? Spoiler alert! Don't spoiler. <laughs> yeah, right. I don't know. There was just some. Yeah, I, I don't want to spoil it for other people. But it, it was disturbing for me in 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 some areas as well. And I, yeah, it's been a while since I've saw it, but I just remember feeling like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'll definitely see Jason in a different light after this, that's for sure. Without a doubt. I mean, like, I honestly figured that movie, I don't want to just stick on this for too long, but what I was expecting would be sort of a comedy thing really hits some some heavy beats. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It really gets kind of dark in that film. Yeah. It does. <laughs> Especially Jay. Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about another, another film that came out uh, last year. It was a, a biography movie called Shooting Clerks. Uh, for most of you, I mean, if you haven't seen Shooting Clerks, it's not what you think. This is not a documentary about the making of the Clerks movie. It's actually a biography, a scripted biography movie. Yeah. With actors about the making of the movie Clerks. I mean, all you guys are in there for cameos and uh, kind of question for both you guys. What did you think of the film? You know, <laughs> was it at all accurate at certain points? Uh, anything you can tell us about sort of the experience of shooting it and how the movie kind of came to be? Not completely accurate. Um, there were some scenes uh, that I kind of had to, it, when I finally saw it last year at Comic-Con, um, I saw, and I could, I could feel the eyes on me <laughs> from the director and the producers as I was sitting there watching it. It's like, I just, just felt them boring their eyes at me to see how I would take it, especially, you know, having somebody um, portray me and, um, but uh, yeah, there were some things that's like, I don't drink wine. I, I don't drink period. So it's, and um, the fact that uh, they had Kevin off in, a, in staying at Sundance on his own, it's like, we were all in a room together. Um, and, and I'm sure there's many other little liberties as well, but I enjoyed it. Um, it was, it was very well done 
for, you know, the, the budget that they had, which was even less than I think uh, what Kevin had to do clerks. Yeah. Uh, Brian, what'd you think I, of the film? I enjoyed working with those guys. Uh, I thought it, you know, it's like 85% accurate. The rest is there's time constraints. There's logistic things that just, just to condense it into a, you know, an, one, an hour and a half movie is tough to do. Um, but for the most part, you know, uh, I thought they did a, an outstanding job uh, casting, especially uh, as to who they cast. And then uh, it was like a four year journey, this, this film being getting little cameos from a lot of people from the viewers universe, like, Jason Mewes and Brian Johnson and Ming Chen and, and things like that. So I'm finally glad that it's locked up and it's ready to, to be uh, released, hopefully very shortly. So uh, I'm very proud of those guys. I'm glad they uh, asked us to be a part of it. I know uh, Kevin, when he watched it, uh, it was an episode of uh, Comic Book Men when uh, AMC had the Comic Book Men show on. Um, you saw that it brought a tear to his eyes. His mom was in the audience. His family was in the audience. And uh, he really enjoyed it. So uh I hope that uh, the rest of the world gets to see it sometime very shortly. I know they're in the final discussions with uh, distribution and locking it up. So, What's the filming locations? Did they actually shoot uh, at the original locations? No, uh, they, they shot in the UK. Yeah, most of them. Really? He, he literally built a, uh, the, the writer, uh, director, uh, producer, literally built a replica of the store downstairs in his father's basement, I believe. <laughs> uh, so the counter, the cigarette racks, all that. And then they, they found various... Um, various locations in Glasgow to uh, to shoot, and then what they did is they found an American producer director to then shoot a lot of the cameos that we shot here and in, in LA and here in Jersey and things like that. Seems like rebuilding the Quick Stop has become sort of a common thing in filmmaking now. Yeah. No, and then in reboot they rebuilt it. What was it done in uh, New Orleans or, or yeah? yeah? Yeah, it was it was the exterior. They rebuilt the exterior down in New Orleans. They took a building down in the New Orleans area. And literally put up a, a whole fake skin on top of it, what they would call Hollywood flat it, the whole thing. And I remember when I first arrived there, um, it was incredible. Me and Kevin just spent, I don't know, a good half an hour or so just staring at this location going like, <laughs> holy crap, where did they get? Like, how did they build it? Like, that's that's it there. It's a. It's a That's facade. not the real place? That's not the real place. Well, the weirdest thing about it is that tree you see in the upper left-hand corner. That tree is next to the building in New Orleans. It's almost in the exact same place that the tree next to the real quick stop down in Leonardo, New Jersey, still exists today. That's amazing. Yeah, we actually made a pilgrimage to the quick stop one time. We were at New York Comic Con, and we saw Kevin with uh, Stan Lee. We saw the comic book men guys, and we are like, hey, we're here. We're far away from Chicago. Why don't we just make the, the, the clerk's? mall rats uh fantasy tour and we went to you know we went to the stash and we went to the the quick stop it looks exactly like that and yeah that tree yeah, is totally yeah. there we always get the man you shot a movie and it's because when people go in the store like it's so tiny it's like god you guys mm -hmm. how did you even fit a crew and camera in here so yeah did you buy a gatorade not nah, stupid question <laughs> uh speaking of comic cons you guys are your your mainstays at, at comic cons lately you can share with us kind of uh i mean you're huge celebrities on the on the Comic Con scene. I mean, uh, thank what, you for what, that. What? It's like in my my ego was very very. <laughs> <laughs> it just got hotter up there in Maryland's <laughs> living room. Um, what what are you some some of your most memorable kind of Comic Con experiences with fans or maybe just on stage appearances? Anything kind of oh. jump out at you? You get asked the same questions all the time. Maryland. <laughs> oh gosh, you know all of it for me, honestly. Um, and I miss doing them right now. Um, but but. Brian, he's he's the bigger main stage than I am, um, or staple, I should say. Um, but I just love talking to the fans, seeing all the costumes, and I. Here's the one thing: I wish I knew about them before I knew about them. <laughs> I would have so been there if I could. Uh -huh. <laughs> Back when you were, you know, in your in your Comic Con years and Comic Con days. Well, I mean. Uh, well, they've grown much bigger. They weren't always as big as they are now. I mean, San no, Diego but, used to be just a, a room with a bunch of long boxes. But it's 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 not that I, you know, I, I, I'm not the geek nerd. And I mean this in the best way that most people are. Um, I, and I, I was sheltered growing up. So, but had I known once I was on my own, um, known about conventions that they're, you know, cause Halloween, I love Halloween dressing up and all that kind of stuff. I, I would have been there and I, you know, I'm a fan of movies as well. And, but I don't, I don't know all the things verbatim the way many of fans do. So it's, it's all of it for me. 
Uh, for me, it's uh, I like the cities that they're in. You know, I, lo I'm a, I love travel, mm -hmm. so uh, I like to visit the cities that they're in and then uh, talking to locals about what great restaurants uh, are cool, what great bars to go to and things like that. As far as the cons themselves, I'm a big fan of other guests. You know, like if I'm at a... If I'm at an event and, you know, Shatner's there, or if I'm at an event and, you know, Batista's there or Michael Rooker or, you know, Sean, Sean uh, um, uh, Gunn or, or Cooper or any of the Andrew, Cooper Andrews or any of these kind of other guests, I love just hanging out with the other guests and just being really cool with them. And, uh, and we're really fortunate. Uh, we're represented by uh, ZSC Entertainment for our conventions, and they've been really cool, and they have great relationships with a lot of these conventions that... They've allowed us to, to travel. We went to Australia. Uh, I've been to Australia twice and New Zealand once. And, and it's been really nice meeting fans in, in England. We went to London and stuff. So it's great meeting the fans, especially internationally, seeing how it yeah. translates and stuff. So um, a lot of it for me is the travel and just hanging out and listening to stories from other celebs and other, uh, and other great vendors to buy things to. Like whenever I see the old school Star Wars toy vendors, I gotta walk really quickly by those booths because <laughs> I don't wanna lose money instead of make money. Speaking <laughs> of fans, you got Ming Chen is actually in the chat room right now. He said, this is going yeah. great. Ming. Ming is the master. We right will now. have, Ming will be on tomorrow. You know, Ming, if you're, if you're watching this, we just saw the trailer for the new trauma film, Shakespeare Shitstorm, and we saw your cameo in the trailer. So Ming is going to make an appearance tomorrow on Mainframe Comic Con. Let's talk a little bit about Clerks. I mean, let's get into it. Um, personal story. Um, I was uh, shown Clerks. I actually used to work at a BP gas station with my friend Mike Schultz. Big shout out to Mike Schultz. Uh, he said, you got to watch this movie. They get it so perfectly. Like all we did was sell cigarettes and porn like all day. <laughs> Porn, cigarettes and Gatorade is like all you sell at a gas station if you've never worked at a gas station. Um, can I, I know you guys get asked this question probably quite a lot. Did you ever work a clerk type job and what was your yeah. favorites? To how, have you ever actually worked at a convenience store and is am I crazy or did they totally just nail it perfectly? I didn't work at a convenience store, but I worked my first job was, and while I was still in high school, working at the Kmart service desk. And I have to say that that's probably the worst job I've ever had as well. Um, you don't ever want to work at the service desk. <laughs> Any service desk. And well, then especially the Kmart. But, but then after the service desk, I got promoted to the kids department where back then everybody would, here, honey, while, you stay here and play while I go shop. <laughs> but you were the babysitter at, at, at the Kmart kids department. I did like I wasn't the babysitter, but you know it's like I had to clean up after them. <laughs> oh God! As far as uh, clerking jobs, I worked a uh, fast food uh, chicken restaurant uh, for a couple of years, and then I moved on to a uh, supermarket job, which I started as a deli clerk, then went over to meat department, then went over to manager to, to seafood department, which I then became a manager. That then they brought me in to do management of store. And uh, that's when I was also doing acting and filming and things like that. So that's when I left that and went on to do acting and other things. I remember uh, coming home to tell my mother that I had left the supermarket that I worked at. And she's like, what the? And she was cursing more than, what the hell do you mean you're quitting that? She's Irish, by the way. Uh, what the hell do you mean you're quitting the grocery store? Don't you know that's a job for life? Everybody needs to eat. And she was right because look at this. A world pandemic, grocery workers are working mm. their ass off to keep us all fed and stocked in toilet paper. So uh, I would have been completely uh, overwhelmed probably by the, the past couple of months with what's going on. So those were my clerking jobs. And yes, I would deal with some of the most backward ass people at times. So. Very true. I can I can attest. Something that blows my mind. Uh, I think it was it last year or the year before. I think it was last year. Clerks was added to the Library of Congress. Uh, National Film Registry. What yeah. an amazing, insane honor that is. I mean, now, you know, if you're if you're in Washington D.C., you want to go see the the Constitution, Declaration, of Independence. You can pop into the Library of Congress and see things like Wizard of Oz, Casablanca, Gone with the Wind, and Clerks is now in there as this is what the '90s was in a nutshell. I mean, how how amazing is that? How insane? Pretty crazy that yeah. that's going to be part of the library that's available to the bunkers. For our, uh, you know, when things got really bad, where we have to bunker the Congress and our government into one, and that's their library that they got to go to for entertainment. That we, talking about snowballing, is in the Library of Congress. And hey. funny enough, just sorry to, to, to interrupt. And funny enough, 
the filmmakers of shooting clerks were the ones that campaigned like mad to get it put in yeah. to the Library of Congress. So big shout out to Christopher Downey and his crew for yeah. putting that request in and getting the fan base to vote on the website for us. And we were the, the that year, this year we got the, or the last year when it was, got the most votes for that year for any film inducted that year. That's amazing. And, and you know, it just goes to show too, because when Clerks did come out, a huge fan base, and I think even to still to this day, is the military. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know what it is? It's because the uh, military, you know, they can't get internet and service that great sometimes at these camps that they're stationed in. And so they bring DVDs. They have sleeves of DVDs, and it's one of the go-to DVDs for them to, to watch. And so uh, I enjoy the fact that, you know, a movie that we did so, so, so many years ago still gets the love that we get, you know, 26 years later now. Yeah. Thanks for the slideshow. You're welcome. <laughs> nice. You've done this before. Brian, and I mean, Marilyn, you too. You know, it's always, uh, the production of Clerks is something that's kind of always fascinated me. You know, we've all heard stories, uh, if you're a member of the fan community. And tell us a little bit about uh, sort of the experience of uh, being cast in the roles of Dante and Veronica. I mean, the shooting process. Um, I mean, what were you guys doing right before the phone rang? And, and I mean, how did you, how'd the movie come about? I mean, I got so many questions. Uh, well, uh, the auditions were held at a community theater that both Brian and myself had done theater for. Um, I heard about the auditions through the grapevine while I was doing a production somewhere else. Uh, and so they wanted us to do a monologue and I did that. And I don't long, I don't remember how long afterwards that Kevin actually called me up, um, wanted me to come down to the convenience store, pick up the script. We talked a little bit. I took it back home with me the next day while I was at work, just not doing any clients. I worked in a salon back then. Uh, I was reading the script and I really enjoyed it. And, and pretty much the role was offered to me right there. Um, and so all I had to do was say yes or no. And obviously we know what the response was on that. <laughs> um, and then not too long after that, he had the callback auditions for all the other roles that were being filled. And that's when I saw Brian and found out that he was going to be um, possibly in the film as well. So I was very happy to see him because it's like we actually had done shows already together. Oh, okay. So what was the what was the shooting schedule like? How long uh, how long were you guys hoed up in the uh, quick stop after hours? <laughs> Brian, Brian was there all the time. I can't well, remember whether I was there two, three, or four days, to be honest, on different occasions. Yeah, I was pretty much there every day uh, for the film. Uh, both myself and Jeff for majority of the film, I should say. Um, I think it was like 22, 23 days with uh, two or three days of daylight filming for the hockey on the roof scene, for uh, driving to the um, to the funeral parlor scene, to uh, like a lot of the exteriors that you saw the outside for. But uh, for the most part, we were pretty much indoors pretty much the entire time. And so what I did was... Uh, was work. I worked a nine to five job. I lived up in New Brunswick, New Jersey, which at the time was like an hour north of where the store is in Leonardo. So I'd work from nine to five. At noon, I'd have a, a lunch break, go home, uh, take a power nap and grab something to eat, and then go back to work and stay until about 4.30 or so, then leave, go home, try to sleep from 5 p.m. till about 9, 9.30 p.m., get up, shower, shit, shave, and then get on the road down there, be, be at the, uh, the store to get into makeup by like 10:30 or so and then uh, start shooting by 11. And I mean then go, it's, it's, and then and then go till 5 or 6 in the morning depending on what we were shooting. How did you hear about it? I mean was it was were we talking ad in the paper kind of thing or uh Brian? Marilyn, uh, me? Uh, yeah. I I got a call from actually the theater owner that Kevin used to hold auditions at. So the First Avenue Playhouse which is still operational down in Leonardo, New Jersey, uh or shall I say Atlantic Highlands, New Jersey. Uh, they were holding, uh, Kevin had gone to them to ask, can I use your theater hold auditions for this film I'm making in a couple of months? And then he was like, sure. And then he's like, could you please uh, send out a notice to your, you know, stable of actors? Can you call them up? Uh, this is before cell phones and this is before the internet. <laughs> so uh, he pretty like much, that. the owner called and, and the actor saying, hey, you're in the age range of what they're looking for. Next month they'll be auditioning for this film. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. Uh, the month came and went. The, the, the auditions, I believe, were Sunday night and Monday night. I missed 
the Sunday night audition because I just totally forgot. Monday morning, Joe Bagnol, uh, one of the owners of the First Avenue Playhouse, called me back to say, hey, Brian, where were you last night? I thought you were going to come down. You're, you know, you're in the right sweet spot of uh, age range that they're looking for. And so uh, I went down. I auditioned. I asked how many principals were there. A gentleman by the name of Vincent Pereira, Kevin's good friend and documentarian, was videotaping the audition, said, oh, there's six, but they're cast. We're just casting you know, day players today. I'm like, oh, okay. And I auditioned. He liked what I did. If, if anybody has the 10-year anniversary Clerks X edition DVDs, the extra DVDs have our auditions on it. So uh, he liked what I did. He called me back. I went back twice for callbacks at the Leonardo uh, Recreational Center, read opposite Kevin. Uh, the uh, independent contractor scene asked how I liked it. I said I liked it. I asked who, he, who they were in the film. He goes, oh, the film's named Clerks, and this is one of the main guys. It's two clerks, and you're one of them. I'm like, oh, I was told back at the audition that the roles were cast. He goes, yeah, don't worry about that. You're a clerk. And then here it is. <laughs> I'm looking at you, and you're a clerk. Um, I know we don't have a whole lot of time left, so, I mean, the people in the chat would just cut my head off if I didn't ask about the recently announced Clerks 3. <laughs> um, it sure. was just announced uh, on Instagram. I'm sure uh, lips are slightly sealed, but well, uh, you know, well, go ahead. They're they're not sealed because they have to be. Kevin hasn't written it yet. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> um, well, let, let me ask you this, because I mean, speaking of well, Kevin, he, he has he, he has written it. It just he hasn't sent it on to us yet. Um, so, uh, no, it's like I actually I don't know if you watched last night, uh, but he did a little interview with Nick Fellinger last night on okay. Instagram Live, and uh, he did talk a little bit about that. Um, he because he has Mallrats, the second yeah. Mallrats written, and now it's needs to be looked at by other people, but uh, he has not. I don't believe he's actually. Okay, he might have started. He might have started Clerks Three. I have I, him on tomorrow oh, morning. Okay. We will settle this tomorrow okay. morning on Mainframe <laughs> Comic. Oh, well, that's gonna be the first question I go. ask. <laughs> but I want to ask you. I mean, uh, to both you, but specifically to you, Brian. I mean, Kevin's gone out and he said in interviews that uh, the way Clerks 2 ended was so poetic. It was so perfect. It's exactly how he wanted the tale to end with, you know, the little dolly shot pulling back through the aisle and it turns to gray. And then you see the, the I think it was the milkmaid at the end. It's like it ended so poetically. It was such a beautiful ending in Clerks 2. What, what do you think is the, the, the reason for going back, not to the trough, but I mean, just kind of going back to the story of Dante and Randall? Um, I think he uh, he really enjoyed doing when we were filming the new Jay and Silent Bob reboot and just playing in that world again. He really did enjoy working with us again. I, and so I remember him wanting to to be a part of of doing that world again. And so when he had written he had written a a, a, a version of Clerks Three script years ago, which we were gonna do. Uh, and then it got into the negotiations of business and contracts and things fell apart. Um, and then that script just sat and sat and sat. And then when he went back to it to look at it, uh, he's like, this is something I never, it's a different, it's a much darker vibe. I would never want to do this, uh, this version of a film. Uh, he gave me an outline overview uh, when I saw him at um, San Diego Comic-Con last year. We were at, on the IMDb boat and he told me his plan and overview what he wants to do with the clerk's character. So I what know the to... outline of what's going on. Right, we have time. As... Let's just give us the outline. We got, we, we, we got time. Yeah, in, you know, I signed a $2 million dis non-disclosure agreement. You pay me $3 million, I'll tell you the whole thing. So I at least have a million dollars to live on. Just All click right, that donate know. button. Double that, actually. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a man of simple means. Anyway, uh, so uh, I hope that um, it's something I think he thinks it'd be kind of poetic. And to be honest with you, it, it does bring a circle really back around again, which I thought would be kind of fun. So if it's the same outline that he told me on the IMDb vote, um, then uh, I think it'd be kind of fun to, to visit these these guys again. So excited to see you guys. We got to go ahead and wrap it up. Marilyn Gigliotti, Brian O'Halloran, thank you so much for coming to Mainframe Comic Con, donating your time uh, for you. our wonderful charities. This has been so much fun. We Thank hope that we can you, yeah. do it again. If we next mainframe, we'll absolutely invite you guys back, and we'll maybe we'll know a little bit more about Clerks Three. And uh, definitely tell Kevin to give me a call to let me know. If I will wants, do that. If anybody wants to reach out to where I am on the internet, there you go. And I also have my own uh, streamcast and podcast going on. The Ohio Unfortunately, Rams. I don't have those pop ups the way he does. Where's your, where's your visual aids, Marilyn? Uh, you know, I, I'm uh, <laughs> I don't have those things. <laughs> Well, thanks a lot, guys. Uh, we're going to go ahead and stop from Chicago Comics, but right after this very short break, we're going to have Andy Park, who is the Director of Visual Development for Marvel Universe. You want to find out why Marvel Cinematic Universe looks the way they does? This guy's going to tell you. And we got the very special Robert Meyer Burnett, 
uh, logging in from LA to moderate that panel. It's going to be a blast. Brian, you got something? No, they, they're filtering my feed right now. That's why I look so good. You look great. <laughs> You're looking a little green. Okay, I get it. I get the it. Matrix. It's the new Matrix. All right, guys. So stick around. We're going to be back in just a couple of minutes, like two minutes, with Andy Park and Robert Meyer Burnett. Bye. Thanks a lot, guys. Stick around. We've got a lot more Mainframe Comic Con right after this. Thank you. This is Batman. I want to be sure you know about Mainframe Comic Con. It'll be online the 25th and the 26th, and all the proceeds are going to the Red Cross and the Hero Initiative. So be sure to check it out. I wanted to jump in here and uh, introduce our next guest host. And Robert, why don't you uh, take it away? Well, hello there. It's I, I have to say, first of all, it's a great honor that you asked me to come host this segment and a few other segments. And to be interviewing our next guest is a real thrill for me because not only am I a fan of his work, but I probably own a lot of the things that he designed in various formats mostly hot toys figures, but uh, it's it's really great uh, to be here. I think what you guys are doing is a fantastic thing. And now that I've missed WonderCon this year, I'm going to miss the San Diego Comic-Con. It would have been my 32nd Comic-Con. And um, you guys have, have, have s just slipped right in and filled my comic convention inkling, hankering, whatever you want to call it. It's great to be here. Uh, well, with no further ado, I'm turning over the mainframe Comic Con to you. All right, then. Well, greetings, everyone out there. Anyone in the 28 known galaxies, if you're a fan of Superman the movie, uh, I am Robert Meyer Burnett. Of course, you might have known me from Collider Heroes or my own show on YouTube, Rob's Observations, but I've also made films. I directed a movie with William Shatner called Free Enterprise. But basically, I'm a fan, or as John, the late John Schnepp used to say, I'm a sweaty. And when Mainframe Comic Con reached out to me and asked me if I would host a few panels, I said, heck yeah, I would. And for my first panel, I am incredibly honored to be moderating a discussion with the Director of Visual Development at Marvel Studios, Andy Park, a guy that I've been aware of for a long time and a man after my own heart, he has Hot Toys figures right behind him. And as everyone <laughs> knows, I am one of one of the biggest Hot Toys freaks in the world. And to Me own too. material that Andy himself has designed is a big thrill. So so give a great – well, we can't really hear any any applause, Andy. But to, <laughs> I'll let's, give a, let's give a, a great big mainframe Comic-Con welcome to the Marvel Studios Director of Visual Development, Andy Park. Andy, let's hey, how's it going? People. They're screaming for you right now. <laughs> I, have, I have to say first, it's 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 a great honor to be here with you. I've I've seen you uh, appear at various conventions. I've watched watched videos with you with you in them, and I know we don't have a, a whole lot of time, but I find it interesting that you were uh, you were a comic book fan from way way back. You became a comic artist yourself, and now twenty twenty marks. I believe your 10th anniversary uh, working yes. at Marvel Studios. You are correct. I am just like you, a comic book fan at heart. I grew up reading comic books. Um, comic Con was, you know, the con that I went to. My yeah. first Comic Con was 1992, I believe. And I drew comic books for the first 10 years of my life. <laughs> what am I saying? <laughs> None of my life, of my career. And yeah, so comic books is in my soul. It's, it's, you know, my, my upbringing, it's my foundation. So 10 years at Marvel Studios working on the films, is, it's been a, it's, I'm still in a dream, you know? It's, it's been an amazing time. Oh, I, I you know, I, well, before we, I, actually, actually, I, I love the story about how you fell in love with the Silver Centurion 
Iron Man armor. And yeah. I, I've told before, but if you could just briefly recount it, because I love I love the idea that you saw a cover and you saw a, an Iron Man design and you were smitten. It was almost like love at first sight. Yeah, you know, I you know, grew up, growing up in the '80s, like I always knew about like comic books, but I, I was never really into them yet. I was more into like cartoons, like Robotech and you know, Transformers, GI Joe, that kind of stuff. Uh, and so I was aware of the Iron Man look with the gold and um, gold and red armor. Sure. But when I went to a comic book store, you know, I grew up in the suburbs in Orange County, um, Southern California. So we didn't have a lot of comic book stores. When they finally opened one up, I went into that store. This is in middle school. And I saw that cover of Iron Man number 200. And I was like, wait, I know what Iron Man is. I've heard of him, but I've never seen that look with his shoulder pads or right. the, the red and silver. And he, he was more bulkier. He was like a little bit more, you know, not as um, form fitting, I guess. Um, and that one just spoke to me, that cover him um, fighting um, Iron Monger. Right. And that was a, a drawing by, um, oh my gosh. Bob Layton, Mark Mark Bright, you know, did the pencils and then Bob Layton inked it. And, and, and then later I found out Mark, uh, Bob Layton designed it. Yeah. So it, it was that cover that got me into comics. So from I became obsessed. I collected every comic book that had that character, including West Coast Avengers. Anytime he had a guest appearance in another book. So I, that was the beginning of my obsession with comic books, with Marvel in particular. I collected, you know, everything. And then eventually got into X-Men and, you know, started evolving but it was that comic book that got me started well it seems strange to say this but i mean marvel studios really was only the mc the mcu i don't know if it was the mcu if you could call it that but it was you, it was only two years old when you were hired on at marvel uh and working in visual development and one of the things that i think is is the great success that leads to the great success of, of what Kevin Feige built at Marvel. I mean, he produced or worked on 13 Marvel movies before Iron Man 1. And mm -hmm. he saw what worked and what didn't. I mean, in the aughts, we had everything from the X-Men to Daredevil and Elektra to Ghost Rider to Spider-Man. But by the time you got to Iron Man, and if you go back and you watch the first Iron Man, it's a terrific film, but it's it's very it, it's very intimate almost. I mean, the, the, the battle at the end with Obadiah Stane, and it's two guys. Mm -hmm. You know, fighting for the soul of a company and the soul of a man. And if you jump ahead to 2019 and you watch, you know, <laughs> Infinity War and Endgame, it's it's an incredible, it's an incredible tr uh, a journey. And yeah. what I think is so, so excellent about what the key to the success is to take the lessons that are learned from the comic book medium and apply them to mm -hmm. motion pictures. And one of those things was the uh, the way that the design of characters while obviously four color spandex is not going to sort of translate to the real <laughs> world but but you you guys especially in visual development because you you're you're sort of the genesis of the characters that that we see on screen i mean you you create them i mean obviously you worked the the, the you've worked on black widow you've worked on uh, ant-man you've worked on hella and Hello was redolent all the way back to Jack Kirby designs. Yep. So how is it that you begin when when somebody, I mean, I'm a I'm a big fan of Moon Knight, so if you can drop a little, no, I'm just kidding. You don't <laughs> have to do that. But um, uh, how do you begin when you are tasked with creating a character from translating a comic character that might look good on the printed page, mm -hmm. but translating them into the real world is a whole different experience and there's proportions you have to deal with there's actual fabrics and materials so when someone comes and says to you yeah we're going to make an ant-man film i know that edgar wright had an ant-man film going on but how do you begin the process and and how long does that process take and are you given uh, a long time do you know years out that we're going to do this movie what is that whole how does that i don't know how, how does it work yeah, yeah. I mean, yes, we are not designing things out of, you know, thin air. We, we're starting with the source material. So, when, you know, after the success of Avengers, you know, Kevin, you know, Feige came to us, told us we're going to be working on Ant-Man and Guardians of the Galaxy. And at that time, you know, um, especially in working on Ant-Man, that was one of the early ones, right? Like, they started working with Edgar Wright really early on, yeah. Um, the very beginning of the MCU. Um, 
So I started doing uh, myself and I got hired initially by Ryan Mannerding, Charlie Wen, who were the heads of the department at that time. And we started doing designs with co and having conversations with Edgar. So we have conversations with the director and the producers uh, from Marvel and we look at the script. Um, but a lot of times we start so early that there's no director and there's no script yet. So it's usually just with conversations with the producer. And by that time, they're not, they're not really like, oh, we want to see it like in this kind of vein or this kind of take. Like they, they, come, they come to us, the luxury of them having a visual development department, which is kind of unique in the film industry where we have, they have an in-house group of artists that are full-time working there for all their films. Like every other film that you see out there are just pick up uh, productions where they hire freelancers and then they let them go once they're done with their services. Our department were there all the time. So we get to work on films and projects really early on a lot of times. And a lot of times we're just kind of making it up. So when I'm working on Ant-Man, I had conversations with Edgar because he was there early on and knowing that, okay, this is not gonna be exactly the comic, what, um, but you know, Hank Pym is gonna be an older, you know, got, older gentleman you know, sure. who, created, who created the suit in the 60s. And then Scott Lang's gonna be wearing that in present day, whatever it was, 2000 and whatever it was at that time. Um, so with, in those conversations, you know, then I'll start looking at the comics. You know, of course, I'll, I'll, I'm always gonna try to respect the source material, looking at the, the years and years and decades of amazing designs, Jack Kirby, you know, Stan Lee creating this, these characters. Um, and a lot of times these characters are designed different ways, right, through the generation, through the years. Sure. So Ant-Man was one that, you know, it's really fun because you look at him, he's classic, but you know, it, it's cool in the comic on four colors, but translated into real world, maybe not so much, you know, the, the, look, the look along with the name Ant-Man, um, it, it, it causes people to chuckle and giggle, right? So, and that's, that's part of the charm is, is finding that balance of like, we, we don't want it to make it a, such a sleek, cool Tony Stark design yeah um we still want it to be analog and kind of retro um the sensibilities are going to be different than tony but it's still and it has to look like it's made in the 60s so you have all the exposed pipings and everything but you also want it to look cool for present day when scott wears it you'd want it to be like this big old clunky astronaut suit you know that doesn't look cool in present day so you know that's when i start doing research you know i started the comics i started doing research um you know, looking at what are other examples of containment suits, you know, with the concept that we're going for. So, sure. of course, a astronaut suits, you know. So looking at the old, you know, old 50s, 60s, you know, when there were the race to go to the moon, that kind of thing, you know, those kind of suits, um, looking at old sci-fi movies. Right. Um, there, was, there was one movie in particular that um, Edgar Wright was really interested in called Diabolique. And oh, I very for that's uh, John Philip Law playing. Play, yeah, play. he's Give got this kind of black cat suit, you know. Oh yeah. So um, what leathers? You know, you got leather, and you got you, you directed by Mario Bava. Yeah, the materials feel retro. So taking all that, you know, into account, then I'll start painting and drawing and trying to come up with different designs. And we always want to give them like as many designs as we can, a full mm -hmm. breadth of like maybe some that are a little bit more sleek some that are a little bit more on the goofy side, you know, cause we don't know exactly where on the scale, you know, do they really want to go comical? Like when someone sees Ant-Man, they're going to be like, ha, ha, like laughing or do they want to see Ant-Man be like, Oh crap, that's, that's pretty badass, you know, and, or is it some, somewhere kind of in between. So we kind of have to explore all those options. Eventually we have meetings with Edgar show and, and um, Kevin Feige and the leadership of Marvel and the producers. And then they start whittling it down. They say what they like, what they don't like. If it's not working, back to the drawing board. And to get an approval, it would usually it takes at least a month, I would say, to wow. get a, any one character uh, approved. But there's been times when it's taken us up to six months, you know, you know, to get an approved design for that one character look. So, and, and it's not just me alone doing the designs. I'm doing for every week I can come up with maybe four to six, you know, to 10 designs. Sure. And then two other artists can do the same amount. So we're doing that every single week or every two weeks. And imagine six months of trying to do, you know, we, we have hundreds of designs at that point to try to get one design. But 
the good, you know, the ones that go faster, maybe, you know, at the fastest is one month and that maybe that took maybe like a dozen takes on that character. So it's, it's, it's a lot of work for what you see in that one, you know, what you see in the film and what you kind of mentioned it also, this is a long answer, by the way, sorry. No, but, no. And then not only we have to come up the look, because obviously in comics, you mentioned it, it's spandex because comic book artists have to draw those characters over and over again. So yeah. imagine if every character has buckles and little, you know, knickknacks and zippers, it would take forever to draw every single panel. So that's why it's usually a na essentially a naked person with cut lines, with just lines and color sure. breakup. That's usually the basic design. Um, so, but then for, in our world, I'm designing it for Paul Rudd that's gonna wear it. Paul Rudd, as well as most actors are not eight heads tall. You know, when you draw a comic book character, you, you idealize them, you elongate them. They're eight, eight or even sometimes nine heads tall. You know, a real human is going to be a lot more squat and the head's going to be a lot more, you know, lollipop style. <laughs> sure. So it gets really challenging to, to try to get an actor who already more idealized than the average human being, as you know, to try to like look like the audience and the fans you know, know how they should look because they've seen them for decades in the comic book pages. So it's a, it's a real challenge. And not only do they have to look good, they have to be able to move and act and punch. So there's a lot of challenges in coming up with that one design that you come up with. Well, that was, I wanted to follow up the question. Uh, do you guys work with the costumers? Like, are there certain fabrics or whether it's leathers or whether it's vinyls or when, when you're coming up with the artistic renderings, are you also taking into consideration the actual materials that are then later going to be used to create the costumes? And how much does that factor into your design work? Yeah, definitely. Um, that's the, one of the, the fun parts of the job is, you know, like a lot, of, we do a lot of designs and the costume designers, a whole separate department, you know, they do other designs, but the ones that we design, we have, we then work with the costume designer to help them to figure out how do we get this design that we see on paper? You know, how do we realize that in, in reality on an actor? So a lot of times, you know, they'll show us like different samples. So if, even if the costume is supposed to be leather, it doesn't necessarily have to be made of leather. Right. It could, sure. be, it, it could be made of materials that are stretchy and then it's printed in a way that looks like a certain material, much like they can make a, you know, an armor look like metal, like the Ant-Man helmet, but it's not actually metal. You know, it's, right. actually, it's not necessarily rubber, but it's like, you know, it can be, it, it's more pliable. It's not as heavy. Um, so there's a lot of back and forth and, and a lot of techniques that they have that it's really cool that they can figure out like, oh, look, it can have this an effect and it gets the effect that you want, but it's more practical in order to achieve the look um, that you have in the concept art. So it's a, it's a lot of trial and error, a lot of back and forth, but when we when when we we all collaborate and get it right, you see the end result. And when I go to the fittings as well, you know that's the other part of the job that I love. Um, going to the fittings with the actor and then seeing the final costume yeah. on the actor, and it it's it's it almost brings a tear to my because it's kind of like you know I've spent months and months with this design in my head, working working, and you know it started from a blank page literally, and you know then I and then to see it on the actor, it's like. It's uh, I don't know how to describe that feeling, but it's uh, it's a tough, it's a feeling that's tough to beat in, in life, and I don't take it for granted. It's no a, it's definitely well, a blessing. When you do that, has there ever been a time where once a costume is on an actor, I mean, I know it's it, it goes through a long process, but that you've seen that there's tweaks that have been made that you're like, you know, maybe there's some things that that now that we've seen the actor in the costume, maybe there's other things we could go back and do, add flourishes or make alterations at all. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because every actor, every human being has different proportions. So certain actors, you have to accommodate for those different nuances, you know? So one, some one actor might have a very long neck or another actor might have very, you know, bro like broad shoulders or some don't have as much as broad of a shoulder or, you know, everyone has different size waists. So sure. there's a lot of different techniques and things that you can do to help you know, just, it's the same thing as a tailor, right? Like if they're fitting a suit to go to a premiere, it's not, there's no two suit that's gonna be exactly the same because they want it to flatter 
the actor or the act actor actress. Right. So we're doing the same thing. And as I and then it's really cool because I do I'll do a design for like let's say the first Ant Man. Then I get to do designs for the the subsequent movies that he makes an appearance, like Ant Man and the Wasp, you know, and so forth. And um, because the more and more I work with them, then I'll know their body proportions. We also get scans of their bodies and everything. So, you know, we'll know, you know, how to kind of work things in the future to, to get the best results. Well, one of the great things too about what Marvel does is they release art books along with the release of all the films. And there's a lot of just unbelievable pre-production artwork. So in addition to, to costumes, do you guys come up with visual concepts where you're creating scenarios or just maybe here's a painting of a battle against such and such and it becomes a jumping off point for previs, for visual effects, for the director and the producers to spitball ideas? Are you doing a lot of that as well? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's our, our job is mainly two things. One is to design the character. So a lot of times that is a costume, but a lot of times it is a CG character or a creature or, or other things sometimes props, but the second part of our main job in the visual development department at Marvel Studios is to do keyframes. So exactly what you described, keyframes are singular moments that are illustrated to depict a, a, an important scene. So a lot of times we, we are painting these keyframe illustrations right. um, in the very beginning, before they film, um, sometimes, you know, I mean, definitely as they're writing the script, but sometimes there's even times when we'll do keyframes even before there's a script, but we definitely do it as they're writing and it helps them. We do it. Yeah. They have the writers, the producers, director, they have ideas in their head, right? And sometimes, you know, and then of course they work with storyboard artists. So that helps to, for them to visualize, oh yeah, I can see it. But to see a fully painted with mood and, you know, the, the yeah. actors likenesses and everything, like there's nothing that can beat that. And it's, it's the cheapest way to do it, right? Obviously, besides hiring an actor and having them do a whole like a photo shoot. So it helps to inspire the production. It helps them to figure out, is this gonna be a cool moment? Uh, an, an example of that was like Giant Man on Civil and so Captain America Civil War. Sure. That was one, they weren't sure if seeing a 65 foot Ant-Man was gonna to be too ridiculous that they're like, oh, I don't know if we're jumping the shark or if that's like wow, that's okay. too goofy. It's always in hindsight that we're like, oh, no, that was amazing, right? Right, right, but sure. Just like the idea that seeing you know seven main heroes on on the screen at the same time was was thought to be impossible at the time, 2012, and then now it's kind of like a no-brainer, right? For when the first Avengers came out, and then we see 65 or whatever hundreds of characters on screen at the same time. But you know, I did a bunch of um, giant man keyframes, um, fighting you know different characters and you know ripping apart a, a plane to help um, sell it for them and for them to help sell it to like the different you know there's different people that they need to like show it to to get kind of the green light right. So that's yeah, it's, it's for inspiration. It's also to help them to figure out you know is this cool and the, the greatest compliment that we can get and we get it occasionally is when we do a keyframe, we show it in a meeting and then they say, they say, I want to see that movie. You know, <laughs> and, and, and we've heard, I've heard that like, you know, a handful of times and that's always like, you know, you feel pretty proud because you know, you work hard. Usually those keyframes take much longer to illustrate. But once you, once they see that Joss Whedon said that to me once and that was like, Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, I, it's sure. strange to me uh, it, that, that other studios that are, that, 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 that everybody doesn't have this kind of a department, especially bringing on comic book artists. I mean, one of the, I think, again, the great success of the Marvel Cinematic Universe is is while they don't adapt things, say, directly, like Age of Ultron or something like yeah. that, they'll, they'll, they'll be inspired by those things. Of course. And then yeah. they make them work within, I mean, obviously putting something on, uh, on, on screen with human beings is different than reading it in a comic book. You have to change and adapt. But I think yeah. one of the secrets of what you guys have done is no one is going to mistake, no one ever goes away from those Marvel films and are disappointed in the design of the characters or the action. I remember- well, there's, I was, there's some people that are disappointed. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I think when, when, I, when I sat in the theater in 2012 and saw Avengers for the first time, I, I had to pinch myself, to be honest, yeah. I couldn't believe that I was watching this. Yeah. Even though I'd seen the lead up to it, I'm like, I can't believe that they've actually made 
yeah. an Avengers movie, you know, and, I know, right? right? And the fact that the tonal shifts going from where Tony Stark began to having him in the same frame with Hulk or or Black Widow uh, or or Captain America and Thor, and it, that might not have worked. You know, it required, yeah, totally. it required a, a lot of a lot of. I mean, this kind of visual development, I think, is key. And now, has it been an interesting journey? How you've now Marvel is obviously moving more into the cosmic realm where you've got the celestials you've got the eternals and we've seen glimpses of those i mean obviously nowhere the head of a celestial you know build a build a yeah. whole, you can have a a whole civilization living in the head of a celestial and has that been going from where you began in 2010 to seeing how the universe the marvel cinematic universe has expanded we've we've gone to various planets and and thanos and We've yeah. seen all different now races and those kinds of things. Has that has that made it? Does it does it make it harder that you have to broaden the canvas and you go from say a single character to to planetary environments and whole different technologies and things like that? Is that or is that just par for the course? Um, I mean, it's, it's par for the course, but it's also it is there are definitely challenges. You know, this is I'm in my I'm starting my 11th year at Marvel Studios. Yeah. 20 whatever order for 23rd film that i'm working on i'm leading a lot of the films um it gets challenging for all of us you know and i'm not the only one leading these films from ryan minerding the head of our department and then we have other leaders um we talk about it it gets challenging because we've done so many films now again 23 20, 23 plus films it's hard to to do it the the, the the thing that we'll hear more and more is like oh we've already that film already has this color sensibility or has this feeling already. Right. That, that character feels like this character. Uh, it's, at this point, it's almost like we're getting to a point where not, it's not just our films, but this film hit all, you know, throughout the whole industry. There's so yeah. many other films, obviously, besides the MCU. It's almost like what hasn't been done? <laughs> like, yeah. every, every, in some ways, everything has been done. So now it's just a matter of doing things in, you know, it kind of varying those things that are familiar, but coming up with new ways of doing it. And I think I give always give credit to Kevin Feige because, you know, you said it earlier on in our interview, but um, he figured out the formula to create success on the big screen was to replicate the success of comic books. Right. Comic books were great because they are a connected universe. And that's what I loved because I would read Iron Man. And then I would go and read West Coast Avengers, and I'd be like, "Oh, they're mentioning stuff that happened in his book. All right, that is, that's awesome." And then sometimes Spider-Man makes an appearance, and then you have to go read Spider-Man to be like, "Oh, that's how that ties in." And yeah. then you have the big, you know, big events that happen, and you're just like, "This is amazing storytelling that you don't get anywhere else except for comic books." And they and Kevin Feige figured out how to do that in the films, and you're just like, "Wow!" Ten years in. We as fans, I'm, even though I work there, we're all fans, and we get to just enjoy these stories. And they they're introducing new characters. Like I've been working on Shang Chi, um, you know, and and WandaVision. and the stories are we're getting to know these characters more and more every single year. Introducing new characters, um, you know, characters like Guardians of the Galaxy, nobody cared about. Now they love them, right? So it's sure. like it's part of the fun. It's not just characters that we knew as kids but introducing new characters and just constantly growing this world and universe is, is what's exciting about, you know, the MCU. Hey Andy, I'm Chad. I just wanted to jump in. Hi. And, and from, uh, from the mainframe comic con, thank you for taking the time and, and of course today. And, and uh, I appreciate that guys. And I was going to help segue. That's why I'm in here. Oh, no problem. No problem. Thank, thanks for having me. It was, it was fun. Awesome. I, I just wanted to ask since you brought up Shang-Chi, I'm a yeah. huge fan of Shang Chi. I mean, Paul Gulacy and Doug Mensch, you know, going back, I've I've got the omnibuses and the fact oh, awesome. the fact that they decided to do Shang Chi, I was I was hoping against all hope. Now, one of my favorite actors in the world is Tony Leung. Oh my gosh, yes. Now, now I know you can't say anything, but I love Tony Leung, and he. I just I want to know if did you get to design something for him. Uh, I, I led the team for this, that the film, but I did not, one of my artists, one of our, one of our artists designed, uh, did designs for like different characters, 
but I can't say specifically who did what. Or what I know, I, I, I know. I do that. It's just that you know, if you look at in the movie Wong Kar Wai is in the mood for love. That Tony Leung, that's peak Tony Leung for me. Yeah, you know, the clothes that he wore. I mean, his suits. And I, I just want to know that my man Tony Leung is going to get his most high-profile American project. Going to be. I just want to make sure that he has the A number one. The that that his look in Shang Chi does the man justice. <laughs> he's in good hands. He's in good hands, and he's, ama he's amazing. And I can't wait for that film. Um, oh, I, yeah, I, yeah, I can't I'm wait. Very, very, very excited uh, for Shang Chi. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. It's. I don't know if Chuck. Did you want to jump in here? No, uh, I just wanted to jump in for just a second. Thank hey, you, Andy, and thank you, Robert. Robert, we can't wait to see you and uh, more panels on Mainframe Comic Con. Yeah. And Andy, good to see you again. We saw uh, up, I moderated that panel for you in uh, in Chicago when you were here. Yeah, so that was glad, fun. Glad that was you guys fun. are doing great. Just wanted to thank you guys both for being here. Uh, remind everybody that uh, if they have a second, head on over to the mainframecomiccon.com. Click the donate button. Uh, all the money raised this weekend is going to go to the American Red Cross COVID-19 Relief Fund and the Hero Initiative. So take a second, give what you can, you know, that's about it. Cool. Thanks, Robert. Oh, Anything yeah. you want to say? Thanks, Rob. I appreciate yeah. it. No, it's, it's, it's great. But I, you know, I wanted, are, are we? We, we we still have time, right? No, we we have we've got uh, the great Ralph Garman and Seth Green oh, queued up, oh. ready to go. Uh oh, this is Batman. I want to be sure you know about Mainframe Comic Con. It'll be online the twenty fifth and the twenty sixth, and all the proceeds are going to the Red Cross and the Hero Initiative. So be sure to check it out. Kevin Conroy. Hey, Ralph. Hey, Chuck. How are you, sir? I'm doing phenomenal. I love the Burt Ward in the background. You got a, some wonderful backdrops going over there. Representing old school here. Yeah. I, I love it. I want to thank you for joining us as a celebrity uh, guest host here at Mainframe Comic Con. I understand you got a very special guest about to come on the camera. Old pal of mine for many years. We're both, both Philly boys, so we got that in common, too. But, of course, he's my pal from Family Guy and Robot Chicken and so many other amazing projects. He is one of the best guys I know. He's Seth Green. There he is. <laughs> hey, buddy. How you doing? I'm doing well. How are how you uh, hanging during all this craziness? Um, you know, I think objectively I'm doing all right. Uh, I'm still working from home, and... Um, my wife is here and we're both doing our best to stay sane and not kill each other. <laughs> That's a good thing. You know, brother, right. uh, thanks for doing the mainframe comic con. When I heard about the cancellation of San Diego, you were the first person I thought of because I know no one else who has a better time down there than you do. That's true. You and I have actually had uh, San Diego comic con in uh, common for years. And it's one of the things that, that we bonded about long before Hollywood was coming to comic con yeah. uh, long before anybody gave it any respectability as uh, the ultimate grassroots marketing campaign for uh, genre pop. Uh, you and I uh, shared it and, yeah. and we're often confined to like, you know, shitty corners of places hiding. <laughs> in fear of, of being, uh, uh, you know, made fun of for liking any of this stuff. <laughs> and now the whole world loves it, just like we do. That is, the, I, I've said that to a bunch of nerd friends of mine who anytime anybody complains about the way something's been translated or the, the, the way that their comic or uh, graphic novel or hero um, has been, you know, translated cinematically, I, I, I feel like we won. It, it, yeah. it, it's like we're, we're living in an age where um, the Infinity War is the highest grossing film of all time. So that 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 seems like a like a triumph. Oh, for sure. You know, um, not only are you an amazing performer, but you're also a producer with Robot Chicken and everything. As I saw things closing down here in Los Angeles, productions being put on hold, I couldn't help but wonder how is that affecting you guys and what you do? Well, um, there are some things that had to be put on pause, uh, especially with respect to stop motion, but there's also a lot that you can get done with respect to pre-production. So right. we're doing more writing. Um, we can still do storyboards. Uh, we can still do visual effects and any editorial. Um, the recording is a little complicated because whoever you're recording has to have a uh, high enough quality home setup to be able to record for broadcast. 
um, or we'll just do temp recording that we can uh, use to build an animatic and then just plan on doing ADR once we've got um, actual animation shot. But we, we've got a bunch of things that are still going, so it's it, it, I definitely haven't been sitting idle. But it is also frustrating um, yeah. to have stuff that you want to make and just not be able to, to do anything about it. Speaking of high-end recording, has Family Guy reached out to you and said, we want to keep recording? What's your system like at home? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. I've done uh, a bunch of tests with Patrick, our engineer. And uh, right before I signed on to this, Claire and I were actually um, sticking up some foam baffling in a closet that we have to try and create enough of a pillow fort type enclosure to get broadcast sound for them. Right. <laughs> I, I love that, though. I actually really like... I don't know. It feels like a triumph of the human spirit that that in these conditions, people are still finding ways to create and connect. Like that's really inspiring and very encouraging. It's it's so easy to get weighed down in a uh, a sense of futile depression, and um, it, it, it's been really rewarding to connect with this community and continue to make stuff. That's why I think it's so great about this. Not only the proceeds going to red cross and the hero initiative but the fact that we can still gather together and talk about things we love in this climate and have some sort of social interaction even though it can't be physical i think is just very much needed right now it really is and i'm i'm grateful to be able to be a part of it um i miss hugging people and i'm uh you know concerned that we'll all be howie mandel in the future just fist bumping <laughs> without any actual physical contact and I don't know what it looks like. At what point are we able to collect in large groups again? Probably after a, there's a vaccine. That seems the most reasonable time to assume. Yeah. But in the meantime, well, thank God for all the technology. You know, right. uh, like what we, if this was even 10 years ago or 20 years ago where it was all dial up and, you know, alphanumeric texting. I just uh, at least we're able to make a, a what feels like a real connection. I appreciate that. And it's the beauty of animation and the stuff that you do over with Robot Chicken is that we can still use our voices to create characters and to entertain and get something done, like you mentioned, while we're all still waiting it out. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's been fun. Um, like it, even though it can it can feel really competitive to create some kind of social media that that anybody notices, I, I've also really enjoyed the freedom of just making whatever and putting it out there and. Considering it not entirely disposable, but 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 about a moment, you know, which is always kind of the way I thought about it. Um, mm -hmm. When I do you know you know Peter Rieger, of course. Sure. Yeah. I got to make a show with him, and he talked to me about becoming fixated. He had gone to that um, uh, that cemetery in New York, that massive, the oldest, largest cemetery, which is like sprawling and full of things for uh, people. Uh, 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 burials from over 100 years ago right and uh one of the tombstones that he found it was a name he'd never heard of and the line underneath it was the greatest actor that ever lived and, <laughs> <laughs> and it set him off on this entire um sort of existential crisis of what is the permanence of anything what is legacy uh with respect to performing or, or entertainment at all and i found myself strangely comforted by that the, the fact that you well, for me, at least, it's like I'm not focused on legacy. I'm not focused on the indelibility of any given thing. It, it is always about that moment, that moment that I as a performer share with an audience, even if I've pre-filmed something that they then receive, um, you know, in, in, in broadcast. Right. Um, and so social media to me feels the same way. It's like that one moment that you connect with somebody. So it, it isn't about the likes or how many likes you get. It's just about putting things out there that other people can feel. You know, our uh, mutual friend, Kevin Smith, I was having the same conversation with him about actors and performers that we thought were legendary, that would be remembered forever. A whole new generation of people have no idea who those people are, you know? Yeah. We're not even mentioning like Clark Gable and Humphrey Bogart and Errol Flynn, that, that old school, you know, group of actors, but people like John Belushi and things that, you know, people that made huge effects on us yeah. now are not necessarily nearly as well known as we expected them to be. And we think sometimes it's the creative ripples that they have created, their influence on us, we influence other people. And so their energy and their talent lives on even though their names and performances may not. Yeah, it's it's always fun to kind of reverse engineer a path between two performers, you know? Um, like whether it's uh, Gwen Stefani to Cardi B, <laughs> you know, or like, Henry Mancini to Seth MacFarlane. There is there is a 
undeniable path between those creative people where over years everyone is influenced by the one that came before them. And so you, you may not remember or even credit the person that started a particular trend, but the effect of it artistically is felt in, in, into infinity. You mentioned writing and doing some stuff from home. I wanted to bring up again for anyone out there. First of all, anyone out there who's watching, if you have questions for Seth, feel free to write them down and I'll try to get to them as soon as, uh, as, soon as I can. But I wanted to mention again your film, Changeland. Oh, thanks. Because I was so blown away when we were doing a little work together. I was helping you uh, host some panels and stuff for some screenings. I thought that work was all so good. And for anyone out there who hasn't seen it, find Changeland, Seth's film, and watch it because it's outstanding. Oh, thanks, man. Any more work in the future for you in terms of writing, directing, live action, another feature, maybe some television? Because I know you've got the the robot chicken thing, it takes up an enormous amount of your time, but I just thought your work in, with Changeland was so good, I'd love to see more of that. Oh, thanks, I really appreciate that. Um, that thing, it took, you know, eight years uh, to get it from the point where I had an idea, like maybe I would write this movie to the point where we were actually shooting it. Um, and it was born out of, um, you know, just a passion I had for the experience that I'd had and uh, wanting to tell a story about life and people and starting over. Um, it's on Hulu now and still on iTunes if anybody um, wants to watch it. As far as stuff that I'm developing, I, I, my, my primary focus is always as a performer. And so I've been trying to um, develop stuff that I could act in as well. Um, I wrote a, a feature script that I was in, had just started to make plans to take out uh, to get produced as we all went into quarantine. And so now any real live action production is being put on hold. Right. Uh, but I am I am developing stuff. Uh, Brecken and I are developing a show that I think it's premature to talk about, but um, rest assured that's something that we want to make. Something It's more in the vein of like um, uh, Eastbound and Down, like that kind of show. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm focused on that. I, I don't have another feature in mind. I haven't had an idea as uh, clear as Changeland was to me to be able to uh, drive the development and production of it. Um, but I have read some things that I'm potentially interested in adapting. Um, but it's a lot, man. Anytime you, you set out to direct anything, it's, it's years of commitment um, and a tremendous amount of work. So, so I always look for the passion in something that's going to carry me even in those um, dark, dark moments that I think every uh, creator or director has where you doubt, why am I making this? And who gives a shit? And <laughs> like, why am I, why am I investing all of my life and um, heart into something that is most likely going to get shit on by 90% of the people, assuming anybody ever even sees it. Right. Um, and so I've always found that the more passionate I am about the subject material, the more, um, clearly I can relate it to an audience, the, the better a chance I have of actually getting an audience. And so I do look for those moments where I'm that inspired to say, this is a thing I'm gonna follow all the way to fruition. You mentioned your pal Breckenmeyer and you guys have done so much good work together over Thanks. the years. I'm always fascinated by um, showbiz duos, people who seem to work <laughs> on some level and they continue to work together over and over again about the chemistry of those relationships. What is it about Brecken that makes you guys so simpatico when you guys get together to work? Um, well, we met we met when we were young, probably like 15 or 16. And um, I've told this story before, but it, it was the first moment that I, I'd always liked him in work that he was in. And something about growing up as a, a young actor, especially in Los Angeles, you tend to meet all of the other young actors that are in your space, either at auditions or seeing their work. Um, and the crazy thing about doing this for as long as I have over 30 years at this point is wow. seeing who sticks with it, who uh, washes out, who completely changes course, um, who's able to continue to, to succeed. Like that's a crazy, it's, it's never accidental. It's always with great um, intent. Um, and Brecken is somebody that I met early on and our sensibility was so aligned and our, 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 our global philosophies seemed um, in Congress with each other. The, the first time he made an impression on me, um, he was dating a girl I went to school with out here and I had a Halloween party and he showed up and it was the year that Paul Rubens got arrested and he was wearing a store-bought Pee Wee Herman costume, like a half mask plastic face, yeah. uh, but, he was, but he was wearing handcuffs. 
And I was like, ah, I think I, I think I really like this guy. <laughs> and then um, he wound up breaking up with that girl, and we wound up running into each other. And I sort of nursed him through that heartache. <laughs> we just became the best of friends. Um, and I've always enjoyed working with him because his work ethic, uh, his creativity. He's he's one of the funniest people I've ever known. Um, one of the fastest sharpest, most brilliantly silly people. And so I feel like anytime we work together, uh, I feel like he elevates me. And so um, I always love to work with him. Uh, I got some questions here from the folks who are watching. Uh, Sharky J double O yeah. wants to know, and, you know, we're dealing now with Disney plus the streaming service where they're doing 9 billion different Star Wars projects. Yeah. People can't help but ask about what's up with Star Wars detours. Any yeah. any future for that? We all want to see it. I don't know. Uh, I don't really have any official updates. The last time that uh, I, I talked about it with anybody at Lucasfilm, it was still in advance of um, uh, 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 the Rise of Skywalker coming out. Um, and because I, I think what it really comes down to is both timing and what the directives of the company overall are. Uh, you know, Star Wars is a massive global brand. And so right. everything that they put out has to coincide or at least not cannibalize some other piece of content. And I always felt like Lego Star Wars, which came out after we had developed detours uh, more succinctly for the benefit of the company, put together a, uh, a merchandising brand and also a comedy brand that lived enough outside of the um, global agreed canon, but didn't compete by implying anything because it's Lego. And so it, it doesn't exactly look like Star Wars, even though it's a Star Wars adjacent thing. And it seemed like all of the Lego comedy uh, filled in the space where detours would have existed. And uh, so, so then the other thing to consider is that Star Wars directive is to um, celebrate the legacy of Carrie Fisher as Princess Leia. And also um, one of the things that they're focused on is making an Obi-Wan show that takes place in that in-between time um, after Obi-Wan uh, was hiding out on Tatooine, but before he interacted with Luke Skywalker. Right. And so that's a period of time that we explored in Detours. Oh. Um, and if you really go back to what the origin of that show was, George Lucas wanted to create an animated comedy in the Star Wars universe, sort of a Simpsons of the Star Wars universe. And so that's what we did, Matt and I, who uh, co-created Robot Chicken. We put together a show um, that we produced 39 episodes of um, and had 62 scripts for and several episodes in various stages of development when we, when we actually got uh, shut down. And I, I need to emphasize, there was no malice in any of it. It really was about what's the smartest plan for Star Wars. And the conversations I had with Kathleen Kennedy were so inspiring and informative, just the way she saw the brand as a global thing into the future. And so rather than think, the thing she kept saying was, this isn't about the next three years of Star Wars, this is about the next 30 years of Star Wars. Mm -hmm. And so at, at that time, rolling something out that was comedically deconstructive when they were about to reintroduce Star Wars to an entire new generation. It just didn't seem to make any sense. And then as their plan evolved and it turned into, you know, what content can we produce? Um, things like The Mandalorian, like awesome shows that fit in with the Star Wars canon without undoing any of it. I think there's always just been a, a thought that our show, because it was something that George developed, and because it takes place in a time period, and because we were so attentive to canon, it's it, it could easily be seen as disrespectful or um, in contrast to what they wanted to do. Yeah. So our Obi-Wan um, is, you know, going a little crazy in the desert and uh, <laughs> doing things like scaring off sand people um, to steal their picnic. And he's working on his, you know, tight five about desert living when he goes to perform at Jabba's palace. And he's kind of a homeless, crazy person who is just trying to get by and right. would occasionally uh, even see Luke Skywalker as a kid and be like, is this the time that I want to go approach that kid? 
And every time it would go wrong, like trying to, I've got your daddy's lightsaber, you should hold it, that kind of thing. <laughs> uh, whenever it would go wrong, he would just wipe the kid's mind. And so by episode 30, we've got conversations between Luke and Uncle Owen, where he's talking about these gaps in his memory and feeling like he's losing time. And, you know, it's all in service to Obi-Wan as kind of a crazy homeless person yeah, <laughs> that keeps fun. using his wizard magic to uh, potentially ruin this kid. Right. And I think there's no way to look at that and plans to develop a sincere live action show about Obi-Wan in that same time period and, yeah. and not feel like they could compete with each other. Yeah, they might bump into each other a little bit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Alina, for your donation, by the way. Alina says, uh, since it's almost Mother's Day, I wanted to ask if you had a favorite and funny memory from your early childhood involving your sweet mom. Thanks, says Alina. You got a, you got a good mom? <coughs> um, you know, my mom is uh, so many things. And on the, <laughs> I can count on, on, on each hand, like the number of amazing, wonderful things that she did to my benefit or on my behalf. And then on the other hand, uh, a proportionate amount of things where you just have to say, I'm sure your intent was correct, but my <laughs> God, my God, did that not come out what correctly? Are you thinking? Yeah. My, uh, what's something fun what's I can confess? Story, for God's sakes. What's that? Pick, pick a sweet story, for God's sakes. Pick a, a sweet good one. story. Um, you know, the truth is my mom literally altered her, the entire trajectory of her life to make sure that I had opportunities as an actor. And so when at six years old, I told her that I wanted to be a performer and started taking every step I could to ensure that she went along with me as my adult chaperone. And she took me uh, to New York four and five times a week on the train back and forth to go on auditions and then she came with me on location to any job that I had and you know that's a very boring thing she didn't want that for herself she was the antithetical stage mom uh, she was just incredibly supportive and helpful to me to make sure that I had opportunities that's the, that's really the sweetest thing I could ever say is that is that she gave that uh like 13 years of her life to me to make sure that I had opportunity yeah, in retrospect, I think that was a wise choice. <laughs> oh, thanks, man. <laughs> um, I want to talk a little bit about Family Guy because since we're both uh, alumni, yeah, it lives on. And I think, you know, it's so funny when you go in to record. I mean, you obviously have enormous chunks of stuff, and I just kind of go in and out and I do my little bits and then I take off. So I end up sometimes not even knowing what's really happening in an episode until I sit down to watch it. <laughs> And now that new episodes <laughs> are airing again on Sundays, I've been watching and it's still so damn funny and so damn sharp. And yeah. Seth, you know, hasn't been as involved as he has been in the past because he's got a million other projects going on at the same time. But the crew that runs Family Guy, I'm just endlessly impressed by the writing and the production and the direction over there. They're just a, an incredible bunch of creative talents. Yeah, it's been awesome. Um, the almost the more he's allowed his entire uh, group of uh, writers and directors and um, other creators to take a lead on it, the, the, the less they are trying to do uh, what, what he would do and the more they are evolving the whole thing in their own voice. Yeah. Um, and it's been, it's been awesome. I love watching the show and I have since the very beginning when I realized that it wasn't necessary for me to read the whole scripts <laughs> to come and do my lines, I just stopped reading the scripts. And what that did is it allowed me to be sincere in my performance because I get directed into exactly the correct tone, but then I still get to watch the show like a fan. Yeah. Um, when we made that whole first run, I had all of those uh, episodes on VHS because once the show got canceled, there was absolutely nowhere to see it. But I showed it to so many people. I was so proud of the fact that it had existed and we got to do it. And I couldn't believe I got to be a part of it. And so the the fact that it came back and has gone on to become the success that it has, it's it, it feels like an alternate timeline. It feels like some weird world where Berenstain Bears is spelled with an A. And all of a sudden, there's no explanation. It's like <laughs> Family Guy's back on the air. It's one of the most popular shows of all time. How's that even happen? Is Chris 
I know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask anyway. Is Chris still a character that you get an enormous amount of joy out of doing? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. It's so much fun. And especially the longer it's gone on, the more shades and colors are true to his personality. And so in the beginning, it felt like it was a very straight line of what was or was not appropriate. And then somewhere along the line, the writers started getting very creative and giving Chris all these other shades where he's both dumb but incredibly intellectual, where he's both, you know, painfully awkward and then remarkably smooth. And it all of these contradictory personality traits seem authentic. Um, and so as a performer, it's endlessly challenging. They're, they're constantly giving me new spins on things, uh, a, di a different persona that Chris takes on or um, singing something or like the, the pace or rhythm of something. It's always a challenge, but I really enjoy it. It's a lot of fun. As a fan, I love those moments when they do an alternate universe version of Chris and he's either older or incredibly smart or incredibly sophisticated. And then to hear you take all of his qualities and that voice and then masterfully just sort of change it into those other personas. It's just so much fun as a fan. Oh, thanks, man. I really, it's it's always an interesting challenge. Anytime they give me like a foreign language to speak in that voice, it's like, all right. I'll never forget, I came in one time and no one had prepared me. And of course I hadn't read the script. So they were like, well, you should have read the script, I guess. Uh, they had me singing um, that In Vogue song, never gonna get it, never gonna get it. Right. But as Chris, and I I did my best. And then I don't know if they were ever even able to get the the rights to that song because I wound up recording uh, maybe Jitterbug or something as an alternate. And so it never even got aired. But I remember just thinking, I appreciate the confidence in me that I could not only hit a note, but hit it as Chris. And then Maverick was the one, uh, Seth was the one who said that um, it's funnier if I'm off key. It's even funnier if it's not a perfect pitch. And so I was like, all right, I won't be as precious. Speaking of our friend, Seth, um, he was kind enough to invite me to play over in his other sandbox, the Orville. Yes. Season. I got yeah, you're so funny that with that that how long did that fucking makeup take? It was it was a nightmare. It took hours. <laughs> and, then, and then I found out that I'm, I have a severe claustrophobia problem, which I oh. didn't even know until they put me inside all that makeup and sealed me up inside that headpiece. <sighs> so in the second season they brought me back and I had a breakdown on the set and I couldn't go on with shooting because I lost my mom. That's hard, man. It was a nightmare. Yeah, but, that's a, um, that's a challenge. You guys have worked together so often. Is there any word about maybe you coming over like Patrick Warburton did and just uh, goofing off and having a little fun over in the Orville? I do whatever. You know, I, I think he knows I'm, I'm down for whatever, but I also, um, he, every different thing you get to make, you get to fill it with all different people, all different performers. Um, and sometimes it's just fun to get to work with a lot of other people. Um, but also, I think that some sometimes people presume that I'm busy or that I don't want to do stuff. But my favorite thing is collaborating. Um, right. Actually, my favorite thing is performing, and then a sub a subline to that is collaborating. So I like, especially if I like somebody or what they're making, I always want to be a part of it. I just never want to intrude or like force myself in. So you're not going to just start hanging around the set, just waiting for him to see you. Uh, <laughs> no, not like that. I'd definitely go, uh, I'm right here. <laughs> I would definitely visit the set. I've got a lot of friends on that set. <laughs> All right. We're running out of time. So I want to hit this real quick. We talked a little bit about robot chicken and how it's affected by the uh, COVID-19 issue that affected all production. So what's the timetable like? What are we, uh, what are we looking forward to in terms of getting uh, new episodes and, and when can we see them? Any, oh. any guesses? Yeah, we've got uh, the whole back half of our 10th season still yet to air, including oh, our 200th episode, uh, which I'm super excited about. But I think that's towards the end of the year, maybe later in summer. I think it was, I'm, I'm honestly not sure of the dates, but there's still 10 episodes uh, of the new season. Um, and then we're, we're going to start writing uh, the 11th season this week, but that'll be months, months until we're in production. It'll be next year before you air that. So these 10 episodes and our 200th episode should tide you over. What's a timetable on an episode going from script to production? Because I know how enormously taxing stop motion can be and how time consuming. What's the average in terms of the turnaround from when you guys finish a script to when it goes on 
on television. Yeah, it's a little more complicated than that because we we bundle produce it to make it cost effective. And so what that means is we'll write five episodes at a time and get those approved and then put those into the process of pre-production, of storyboarding, of recording, um, of building, and then even shooting. And so it's sort of like a conveyor belt where different things drop in all the time. Um, we shoot you know, like 23 or 25 stages at the same time, which means we're we're shooting like five to eight episodes at the same time. And so the entire run of production from the time we start writing until the time we deliver our last finished episode is about 13 months. Wow. Um, but the, the, the incremental, we'll, we'll try and shoot um, enough material for a single episode in about eight days. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, I can tell by Chuck Lindsay showing up. I think. Uh, <laughs> Hi, Chuck. You guys are awesome, Seth. I can't wait to have you back on uh, tomorrow, right? Oh yeah, yeah. I'm doing a a I'm robot chicken that. dedicated panel with Brecken and Donald Faison and Matt Senreich. Well, huge thanks to Ralph, Seth. We'll see you tomorrow, Ralph. Ralph, all the back. best. I want to say this one thing from uh, generous uh, contribution from Hal uh, Swires, twenty dollars. Uh, Super Chat, thank you so much. Said Thanks, This Al. is really great. It's good to hear how important parents and family are in fostering success. Hang in there, everyone. Thanks, Seth. Thanks so much, Hal. Thank you, Hal. All right, guys, stick around. Uh, up next, we got Natalie Dreyfus from The Flash and Mr. J. Washington making his return to Mainframe Comic Con. We'll be right back in just a second. Thanks, Ralph and Seth. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thanks everybody who watched. Thanks, everybody who's donating. Really appreciate it. Awesome. See you tomorrow, Seth. See you then. There are a lot of bad people in the world. Charlie Manx is one of them. I'll admit I underestimated you. I will stop you even if it kills you. That's a promise. <laughs> Think of me at Christmas time, won't you? All right, guys, we are not done by a long shot. We're still over here at Chicago Comics in uh, this man's hometown, Mr. Jay Washington. Yes, Welcome indeed. Back today. Thank you for having awesome, me. We had an awesome interview earlier today, uh, but none as awesome as the one you're about to have. So I'm going to go ahead and throw it to you. Just a reminder, guys, go to mainframecomiccon.com, click the donate button. All the money's going to charity. So, Jay, take it away, my man. Appreciate it, man. Welcome, everybody, again to Mainframe Comic Con. I am your resident supervillain, Mr. Jay Washington. And this ain't about me. This is about the lovely guest I have the honor of talking to. You know her from the originals, from Still the King. And now she plays Sue Dearborn on CW's The Flash. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Natalie Dreyfus. Hi. Hi, Jay. Hey, how are you? I'm great. I'm so excited to be here. Oh, I'm glad, I'm glad I'm excited to talk to you as well. You know what I'm saying? Granted, it's out, it's hot out here in Los Angeles and we can't do nothing. So we might as well have a it's good conversation. So hot. Yeah. Like, my living room is hot. I have I need to get back into the bedroom as soon as we're done with this oh, so I can no. get back to my AC. It's so hot today. I'm How blowing do my like AC at like 69 degrees. Concert? What do you think? Oh, that is so dope. Isn't she amazing? Look at her vest. Look at them show. Look at them sleeves. Look at those I know. sleeves. I know. I was like, I usually wear my hair at that length too. Like that's usually the length I wear. Uh -huh. it. And I was like, this is meant to be. She's so let my me bob. Ask you, so let me ask you about that. Did you do a lot of research for the character before getting the role? Well, after getting the not role, should all. I say? Yeah, after for sure, but not at all. It's it's all so new to me. Mm -hmm. You know, this whole the whole DC universe is so new to me, and I've just had such a fun time learning. You know, and like interacting with fans over social media, and how excited everybody is. I just had no idea the journey this was going to be. It's so fun. Oh, you are part of an amazing universe. Like it's massive. Not just the show you're on in the Flash. I, I have a lot of friends on both Flash that work with Black Lightning and everything. So to see you be a part of a new universe and have to take all of this magnitude of what it is, and is like I know you can sometimes it can sometimes feel overwhelming, if you will. What was it like yeah, for stepping sure. on a set of the Flash, though? It was interesting. I've been working for a long time. I've been doing this a long time, and I don't really get nervous anymore you know, going on to a new set, even if it's, you know, something that's been established for six years, I usually don't get nervous. And my first day I walked in and I was like, oh, 
<laughs> I was like, <laughs> genuinely like it got me and I looked mm. at Hartley and I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm nervous. Like I, I haven't felt nerves in forever. And I remember like one of my mentors, like early on had told me nerves are just a sign that you care, you know? And I, I just realized that I care so much about mm -hmm. this job and I was so excited. It's a big set and there's a lot of people. There's, you know, a rotating crew because there's so much going on. There's so many cast members and they're all such a tight knit family. So it was really intimidating, uh, more in intimidating than I an anticipated, but it was so exciting. So what's it been like working with Hartley directly? Because that those are the main scenes we've been seeing, the Ralph Dibney and Sue Dearborn. What has it been like? Because Hartley's a joker. It's, it's just what he is. And that's just on and off yeah. the show. So yeah. what has it been like? <laughs> I mean, I'm a joker too. <laughs> oh. I, I like to play. I'm definitely one of those actors that's, you know, uh, thinks that being on set and the attitude that you bring to it it just it just brings so much life to your performance if you can mm -hmm. bring yourself to the set and have a good time. Uh, Hartley and I have known each other for 10 years. So we did ah. a show together uh, in 2010. And uh, when I got the audition, I it was a dummy side. So I didn't know what it was. Of course, and then yeah. I started to figure it out that it was to play Ralph's love interest. And so I... I hit him up and I was like, hey, this is what's going on. And he was like, oh, I know. He's like, I'm <laughs> so stoked. He's like, oh, I know it's you. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Because like he knew my attitude and my personality and how much fun we were about to have. And so he was really excited during the audition process even to like know that we're friends and have that banter already. And then, you know, in this last episode, I got to play with Carlos and meet Cisco. And it was super fun and watching them play is next level. Fun. That's what I was going to ask you about because yeah. you you now see another element of it and Carlos has fun on every episode given a chance. He has these crazy code names and everything. And so to watch oh, him yeah. go back and forth with you as the, you know, fake character at first, that had to have yeah. you cracking up and having to hold your mouth. Oh yeah, it was so good. And just like their chemistry together is so fun. They're so wild. I think it's good to have like the lady on the set, like whipping mm -hmm. the boys into shape. I'm like, let's go, boys, <laughs> get it together. Stop laughing. <laughs> they need a, They need a good work wife. Um, no, they were so much fun though, honestly. And I was so excited to work with a new character because I'd really just been with Hartley, and so it was really fun to to you know meet Carlos and have a good time with him. He's so like he brings so much to every scene. Mm -hmm. And he has so many ideas of like where it can go and how it, how the characters can interact. And I just feel like that brings so much relationship. Even in that small scene, I feel like immediately Sue and Cisco have a relationship. You know, he mm -hmm. like looked at me and he was like, oh, you're not what I thought. And I was like, what does that mean? What do you mean? I'm not what you thought. Let's play. So Let's play. Really have fun. some fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you've got to this recent episode, we're starting to see more of you doing more different things. Now you had the acrobatics, the Black Widow-esque look with the suit. How did that feel? Did you get a chance to work with the stunt team directly and the choreographies to set all that up? How did that work? Oh, yeah. I've worked really, really closely with the stunt team. They are so incredible and so efficient. But I've just gotten to do so much more than I expected. You know, it, it, especially in that first episode that you see me, there was a long fight sequence and they don't know me. So I came in and I, I watched them do it. I was watching them rehearse and I looked at them and I was like, hey, uh, I'm a dancer. I've danced my whole life, <laughs> so I can do all that. And they were like, really? And I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. And they were like, okay, well, well, we'll take some time to teach you. And I was like, no, I got it. Okay, I've like, I I, I, I seen all this. I, yeah, I'm no, good. I got it. I can pick it up. I'm good with choreography. And they were like, well, let's, you know, let's. And then I started moving and they were like, oh, this is going to be fun. Oh, this is going to be real fun. <laughs> they were like, she can actually move, you know? So it was mm. really cool for me to finally have something that like all those years of dance finally comes into play because I don't dance anymore. So it's like, I was like, this is what I was trained to do. <laughs> Uh, so it was really cool. I got to jump in and obviously like they're not throwing me and like throwing me into tables and things like that. You know, they, they definitely do. I don't want to take away anything from the stunt team because they are amazing and putting themselves in incredible positions. But, uh, you know, they, 
they do let me do wire work. I've never done wire work before. They harness me, they throw me off buildings. Like I was just not expecting any of this because they, I don't know, you know, I just got this job and I, I didn't really know what it was going to entail. It's so different from the comics. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd looked up a lot of stuff about Sue and Ralph, but obviously the flash is really taking it in a new direction and they want Sue to be her own like full fledged character. And adding in the, the cat burglar suit and stuff was my first clue that this was not going to be the same. <laughs> and I was like, what am I in for? I am, I am, I like hit a, some sort of lottery. I don't understand. So <laughs> you started looking at so this excited. shirt. Like this isn't the same character anymore. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> where's her vest? Uh, no, she, uh, she's so much fun to play and I'm so excited for what's coming. And I, it's just, it's, it's a real, it's a real treat. Well, now that you go that route, we know in the comics, for those who have read the comics, Sue and Ralph get married, okay? We know it. How long does it look like until we get that point? Or will that be something that almost splits them up before we get there? Yeah, that's the thing is because they took such a different route, we don't actually know that they're going to end up together. All we know at this point, I don't know. All mm -hmm. I know at this point is that we are so drawn to each other as characters mm -hmm. and neither of us really know why. And I think that's more fun as an actor to just not know where we're going because I can understand that like, I'm very drawn to this person, but I don't understand why. And he's really just getting in the way of my motives. And I think for him being like the detective mind that he has and whatever, it seems like he should be able to figure me out. And I'm just this big mystery. And I think it just makes me really intriguing to him. And he can't seem to, you know, keep me in one place. And in this last episode, you got to see him make the decision to let me go. I gave him the diamond and, you know, he let me go. So uh, that was an interesting choice for Ralph and to see that he sees beyond what she's doing. And, and he's, he knows that there's something deeper to her. So we don't know exactly where it's going in terms of the marriage and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. We know that like, you know, identity crisis is a totally different thing and, uh, and that anything can happen. Mm -hmm. So as far as I know, and what I need to know is just that like, Ralph is just a huge part of my future, but I don't know how. Now, you have been with Ralph and you just recently got introduced to Cisco. Which cast member, which regular cast member would you love to have the most interaction with? Of course, this is with standing Grant and as Barry. So you can't you can't take Grant Gustin as Barry because that's a given without him. I can't. Nope. This is <laughs> a given. It's a given. You want to be on the set with the flash. I mean, that's a given. So you have to give another choice now. Nah. I've been seeing a lot of Killer Frost and Sue mashup like videos like I've tagged in on Instagram. Like mm -hmm. I just feel like that uh those two like uh witty women together like bantering would be really fun. Um and so I feel like that would be my my favorite uh like if I were to look into the future, that would be a really fun friendship. Sorry, I had to put you on the spot with it because I know your first answer was going to be like the Flash, of course. I'm like, nope. I want to work with the Flash. <laughs> I mean, you, we know that. I mean, that's a given. That's why I say you can't choose them. That's a given. Yeah. Now, everybody is dealing with this entire quarantine and everything. We're on lockdown. I was going through some of your tweets. I'm like, I feel you just being in the house. And like, sometimes you're like, yo, I've been prepared for this as a stand up and actor. Sometimes I'm like, I just don't want to be around people. I just want to be yeah. home. But what have you found now? Everybody's been binge watching things. So with that, what has been your show to binge watch on? Yeah, I mean, it's so intense, right? Like, I hope you're good. I hope you're okay. Mm -hmm. I, I'm shouting out to everybody. Like Everybody's like, it, probably like, yeah, we're, we're good. All, it's the weirdest thing because I feel like every like three days, I'm like, I got this. Like, I'm adjusted. Like, mm -hmm. I'm okay. This is my new life. I don't see people. That's <laughs> fine. And then like the fourth day comes and I'm like, in the darkest hole, you know, and it comes out of nowhere. And I, yeah. I think I'm good. I think I'm adjusted. And then all of a sudden I feel horrible and I can't get out of bed. And I'm like, Oh, what's happening? <laughs> like I really do miss human interaction. Um, you know, it's like with the postmate brings me food and I'm like, ha! through the gate. <laughs> I hope you're you. okay. <laughs> like leaving them little treats outside. Be like, Thank you. Thank you for everything. For keeping I appreciate me everything about you. I miss life. Um, 
Yeah, it's it's such an intense time. I have been uh, doing a ton of like creative stuff, just trying to make as much stuff as possible. Mm. And the biggest thing I've learned is that doing anything for the first time sucks. Yes. And I hate it. <laughs> so I've been forcing myself to do new things because it sucks. And being really patient. The first time you do anything, it sucks. I tried watercolors yesterday. I'm terrible at it. But you know what? I tried it and I did it. Uh, so I try to binge watch stuff in the background as I'm mm -hmm. going through my, you know, first times. And uh, right now I actually, I went back in and started House of Cards over again because I haven't mm -hmm. seen it in so long. Mm -hmm. And then I, I finished Outlander. I was like, I just want to be in like some drama, like some like deep drama that I also like don't really have to watch. I can just listen to it. And, like, I did I Banshee on Cinemax. Banshee's oh, really? amazing. Like I saw a couple of, my buddy had introduced me to a couple of episodes and I was like, all right, cool. Then I had forgot about it. But then I was scrolling through all the streaming sites that we all have. And I was like, Banshee. All right. And I watched it from the beginning and I was like, oh my dear Lord, I loved it. And now I'm at American Gods. So that is consumed all of my time. But we got a couple of super chats for you. Uh, Captain J10 says, I love how you play Sue. Love your work. Thank you. That's so sweet, man. And Sleetable says, thanks for doing this and bringing Natalie to all of us. Oh, thanks, they Sleetable. love you. They love you. It's it's crazy how positive the fans have been. And just like I like the messages I receive and I try to read as many of them as I can are so overwhelmingly kind and positive. It makes mm -hmm. me even more excited to give this role everything I have. Like people are, have been waiting for Sue for a long time. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm the first person to play her. So it's really cool for me. It's such an honor. And just to be a part of DC, like this is crazy. Could you imagine how great with everything going on? We're not going to have it. But ha had Comic-Con gone on this year, you going yeah. down to San Diego as this character in front of this massive crowd to receive you, like they already show their love through social media, but to have you in person, that energy would probably have just been bananas. Yeah. And honestly, I feel it even if it's through social media, mm -hmm. like, the, uh, the amount of like positivity, it's the internet. I expect half hate, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> yes. you expect it, you're like, yeah. you don't go through this long into the business and think like, I break down, love me. Like they don't, you know? And so I've really been like expecting people to give me a hard time about this character because it's been so like long awaited. And actually I've just been really shocked at how amazing the fans have been and excited and positive. And like, it just makes me want to do more and, and push myself more to like bring her to life and bring myself to it. And it just like, it really shocks me. I feel like the flash fans are just the best. It's crazy. I think it, it does in part me as a fan as well. I think it's in part to we've come to understand that they have to change certain characters a bit to make them digestible for TV. Like every character can't translate exactly the same from pages and panels in a comic book to TV. And the way you've given the translation of Sue has been something that people can be like, OK, I see this. And then seeing Ralph Dibney again, that personal connection you all already have helps out a lot. Yeah, so that it does. Works. Yeah, the chemistry between us is so easy and on set it's so fun. And I think like the crew recognized that right away that this was going to be a good thing because it brings a lot of lightness and it brings a lot of energy and just like us just having a good time. Like you said, like he's a jokester and so mm -hmm. on. So <laughs> like it's it's definitely a good time. There's so many giggles and, and I feel like you see that in the scenes and like it I wasn't expecting that doing, you know, uh an episodic you know, character yeah. to me, I come from a world of comedy. And so I was expecting it to be a lot like darker and longer and harder. And like, they weren't going to allow, allow that playfulness to come in. But the well, that's because you're on the playful show. You're on, now, had it been error at the time, the playful show. you're on the playful I show. I know. I, I, I feel so lucky to be on this, <laughs> like this specific set because it's amazing. Like it's so fun. And, uh, I, I can't wait to get back. It's it's so much fun. And you know, I'm I'm from LA and going up to Vancouver is a is a thing. You know, you leave yeah. everything. But because it's so fun, I get so excited to even, you know, just I leave my whole life behind to be there because it's the best. And anytime they'll have me, I'm like, yes. So we got a couple more questions for you in the chat. Mustafa Saad yes. says, You're awesome as Sue Dearborn. Question What do you want to see next for her character arc? 
Yeah, I am so excited for everybody to see what's coming next. <laughs> uh, it's gonna be awesome. Yeah, I think that what I'm most excited about is definitely um, like the, her motives coming out. Like, what is she doing? She's making what? weird moves, <laughs> you know? And so I, I'm excited for people to kind of understand why and what's going on with her. And I think, uh, what I would love to see in the character arc is I would love to see them start to get together. I think that'd be so fun. Like I root for them already. I think it's <laughs> going to be amazing. I hope they do that. I mm -hmm. honestly don't know, but I like, I root for them. I'm like, I hope that we get to play in that arena. You of, feel like, the vibes every episode, the two, the, the two episodes they've been together. You feel it for already. Sure. Yeah, it for sure. Already. I love that relationship. And I feel like, uh, like, I would like Harley and I were talking about. It, we we're like, oh my god, like our fight scenes would be so cool together if like we could let he'd like throw me, like stretch yep. my arm, like you know what I mean? Like, like I was like, oh my god, that would be so awesome. So in terms of like where we're going, I definitely feel like um, I would love to see that. I just don't know if that's that's in the cards, but I hope it is. I'm gonna go to some more questions from the chat. Caitlin uh, Siler says Sue is amazing. Question: Would you like to see Sue interact with Iris? Now that would have to be the real Iris, not the one that's the mirror one that we see now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. I mean, honestly, it's so funny because there's so many cast members. I really haven't had I haven't had the chance to meet everybody. So, you know, I've been hoping to meet as many characters as I can, mm -hmm. but obviously like I would and especially the women, like it's awesome to, you know, see these powerful, awesome female characters and that's what I love about DC. Like it really just it it's the way that they portray women and they give mm -hmm. them so much com like complex, amazing character arcs. I'm just, it's such an honor that I get to be in that company, you know? So the more, the more characters I can interact with. And I think sure. one of the great things we see about the, the uh, female characters are they all have arcs and journeys. They all don't just start one way. And then what we get is that you see them go through their right. highs and lows their peaks and valleys and whatnot. So I'm going to switch gears real quick because I want to lighten it up. Random question. What's yeah. your go-to karaoke song? Um, Son of a Preacher Man. <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you. Okay. Do you like that? Yeah. Can that's, you picture it? Yeah. The only one who can have. Now I want to watch Pulp Fiction. Like now I'm going to be watching that. I want to watch Pulp Fiction every day. <laughs> I mean, it's available on Hulu on Stars. Yeah. You can check that. <laughs> check that. Let you me like see if we got... also kind of work for Pulp Fiction somehow. You're like, I, it's available I, on Hulu. And Stars. <laughs> if I did, I need to check right now. We got another question from <laughs> me. It's from Carol, Carolina Pineda. She says, What do you think would be Sue's role on Team Flash if she joined? Uh, I definitely feel like. She brings an awesome uh, detective mind to like, you know, give a little bit of Watson to Sherlock here. You know, I feel like that would be awesome for Ralph. And I also feel like she's a pretty badass fighter. She took on Ultraviolet in the first episode. So like- We don't give her that much credit for that. Like, yo, Ultraviolet was a thing. And like Sue comes uh, in yeah. and fighting. She, I, I, I just walk right up to her. I'm like, bring it. And she's like, and he's like, is there anyone that doesn't hate you? I'm like, not really. Everyone <laughs> hates me. <laughs> like, I've I've obviously gotten in some some stuff before. Um, so yeah, I would definitely say that I would bring some some female strength. Oh, that was so the muscle thing was cute because it wasn't even all the way up. I it like, was low. You know, like I like was, I like started to do it, and then I was like, I don't really have the muscles to back this. Like, there's a little baby one right there. I, I see it. I see a little bit of the definition right there. See? It's right there, but I don't want you to strain it, so you might want to stop a little. Okay. Okay. Oh. Okay, so that was for all the people watching at home. And our one of the programmers of Mainframe Comic Con, Chuck Lindsay, has joined Hi, us. Chuck. What happened, Chuck? Man, I could listen to you guys talk for a whole nother hour. It's it got just so great right there at the end. Karaoke questions, muscles, man, this is awesome. You gotta know how to do you yeah. can't just ask the same thing. First of all, as a stand-up and actor, pro wrestler, and a fan of these shows, I know how to talk to people, Chuck. What is wrong with you? Oh, I know. She I know. does it all. Natalie, we can't thank you enough for coming to Mainframe Comic Con today. This is so exciting. This you, is like my first like 
Comic Con, anything, and it's, I'm so excited. I'm Before like, Before you go, I, tell people how they can find you on social media too. I'm at Natalie Dreyfus on Twitter and Instagram. Just my name. All right, Just Jay. Find me anywhere. Jay, man, we can't thank you enough for coming on. Thanks for you, having you, me. Man. You're always a consummate professional and a hilarious guy. Appreciate uh, it. So where can okay, people find you? Thank you so much. You oh, are welcome. You. I'm about to go do yoga with Adrian from YouTube, but you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Mr. J Washington, M-R-J-A-Y. You should know how to spell Washington. And I'm going to get muscles like Natalie just so I can be able to do all the poses and the flex. And the I'm glad I could here. inspire you today. You, you definitely did. You definitely a, did. A lot of muscles on your Instagram, Jay. We already know that. Uh, so guys, this is how this is going to work. Can you believe it's been four hours already of live con coverage here at Mainframe Comic Con? It is flying by. We are not done by a long shot. Coming up is the original Jennifer Parker from Back to the Future. We're going to be sitting down with Claudia Wells talking about Back to the Future, having a lot of fun. So unfortunately, this stream is going to end. But if you go to mainframecomiccon.com, the video page, you're going to see that's where the second stream starts. So we got four, eight more hours of mainframe going on today. So go to Thank mainframe. Thank you guys Comic for doing Con. this. This is so cool. This we is awesome. Raised, I don't have and any congrats. Account. We've raised so much money. Like we, we, congrats. 100% that's of it is amazing. Going to and thank you to the fans. Honestly, you guys are are more than I could have ever hoped for. So thanks. Thank you so much. You got so many great comments in the comments that you might have more comments than anybody else. Oh, that's amazing. Well, Natalie, right, well, thank you guys. So thank much. you so much, Jay. Thank you. You're the man. Bye. Stay safe, everybody. <laughs> Appreciate you. All right, guys. Head on over to mainframecomiccon.com. Click on the live video tab, and we are starting feed number two in just a couple of minutes right here from Chicago Comics. See you in a bit. <laughs>